Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, December 13th, 2015. This is episode 1246. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Slack, a messaging app for teams. Slack makes your work life simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. Try it free and get a $100 credit towards a paid plan by going to slack.com slash tech guy. And by Epson's new EcoTank printers. With Epson's line of super tank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography. Smartphones, smart watches, you know that. You know the drill. You know the drill by now. 8888-ASK-LEO is uh, my phone number. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. And we have stations all over the place. 8888-ASK-LEO, same number. However, if you're listening on the Internet, and I know a lot of you are, and you're outside the U.S. and Canada, you can still reach us by using your Skype. Not to Skype us, but to Skype to our number. And because it's a toll free number, Skype out won't cost you anything. 888 827 Five five three six website sure should remember that. I don't. You don't need this. I know. So I've seen people sometimes in our studios with pad and paper writing, writing, writing. You don't have to do that because we've got a guy who does that. James Deruvo. He's writing, 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 but he's putting it up on the internet at our website techguylabs.com. So every link, every topic will uh, be uh, featured at techguylabs.com. And there's no sign up. There's no. There's no barriers. Doesn't cost you anything. We won't ask for your email or anything. You just go there. It's kind of like uh, the, the free-for-all of the Internet. My like, gosh. TechGuyLabs.com. We even put audio and video of the shows there after the fact. Of course, you can always hear us on iHeartRadio, and uh, many of our uh, local stations stream it as well. So there's lots of ways to listen. Uh, hello. So I've been playing with, and I have a kind of a contrarian opinion of, Google's new tablet. This is the uh, Pixel C, which is an interesting name uh, for Google to assign it. And I'll tell you why. The, their phones are the Nexus phones, right? The Nexus, uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6P, 5X. Um, those are Google's phones, Android devices. But this is the first Android device they've made that's not a Nexus. Even the tablets were Nexus 9, Nexus 7. This is the first device Google has made that is not a Nexus. It's a Pixel and Pixel normally is the naming brand for, well, they've only made a couple of Pixel devices. They're uh, Chromebooks, laptop computers running the Chrome operating system that Google makes. Uh, Google makes two different operating systems, Android, which is, of course, mostly phones, and uh, uh, the Chrome OS, which is really kind of laptops. So we thought it odd that they named this the Pixel C. The, the press corps, the tech press corps said, what could a Pixel C be? And we even, I think there was even speculation that it might be the the long rumored merger of Android and Chrome OS. Well, it's not. It's just an Android tablet. But it's an Android tablet that has a few interesting tricks up its sleeve. You can get it standalone as a tablet for about the same price as other high end tablets 500 bucks with 32 gigs of RAM. I think it's 600 bucks with 64 gigs of RAM. That's the version I bought. Just made, became available this week. I was actually stunned i i it, they announced it and made it available in the google store on tuesday i ordered it on tuesday got it on wednesday thank you google wow i guess they were in a hurry this uh some interesting things the, the type c connector that's how you charge it that's how uh all of google's new phones are working that way we're seeing more and more phones do this i think the usb type c connector which is a new connector 
is going to end up being the de facto connector for phones and maybe tablets and maybe even laptop chargers, which would be awesome because then all of your cables would work with everything. For now, it means you know a new cabling, not the micro USB you've probably been using, but Type C. I like Type C, and it can do a lot of stuff. It's very fast. Um, it is uh, not the auto audio quality, not great on it. Screen though is quite nice. It's a four by three tablet. It looks a lot like the iPad. Screen's a pretty crisp, high resolution screen. I think it's 309 dots per inch, something around there. And it's running Android Marshmallow, the latest version of uh, Android 6.01. But you can also buy for a kind of pricey amount and a nice metal keyboard. Uh, with real real typing keys, it's a real like a real laptop, um, but it's a uh, compressed because it's smaller because it's not as big as a laptop, and then it attaches with a very interesting magnetic mechanism, so it can be used as a cover and it just attaches magnetically uh, to the front of the Pixel tablet, and then if you if you want to use it as a keyboard, you slide it off the tablet or slide the tablet off it, put the tablet down on the magnet the top piece Did you hear that click it's a pretty strong magnet and then you tilt it up and now it's very much like a laptop like kind of like a small little laptop like a little 10 inch laptop the biggest difference is you're running android and here's where i i have a little kind of a contrarian point of view a lot of the reviewers said well android's just not ready for tablets a lot of the apps oh they're not tablet ready things like that and i have to say maybe it's just because i really like android uh, but I'm very comfortable with this uh, for a tablet. Here's here's why. I mean, uh, contrary to the you know, the, what is the competition? Well, the competition is, I guess, other Android tablets or an iPad. And with an iPad, the user interface, just as with the iPhone, is just a grid of icons. That's it. Uh, but with Android, and one of the reasons I've always liked Android is it has these things called widgets. They're live uh, tiles that you can put right on the desktop there, along with your icons for your apps that tell you things. And uh, now I now I have to admit, if somebody looks at my my uh, my Pixel C, they're going to say, well, that's gaudy. Looks like Times Square billboards. You got stuff blinking and flashing and all sorts. But uh, for me, it's a great informational dashboard. I can really see everything that's going on. Uh, and and what I've done is I've made different Android pages. So I have a, a media page that has all the players with the play buttons and everything and what song is playing. Uh, my my uh, audio books, too. I have a news page, a news screen, which has widgets with big pictures and text for all the different news publications I subscribe to. So it's a really uh, great graphical dashboard that I can look at. Now, one of the complaints people have is that some Android apps are just not tablet ready. You'll launch instant. And I feel like this is these are these companies just being a little bit non-cooperative or something you launch instagram and it's sideways i mean it doesn't it's uh, it only works in portrait mode which is fine for a phone that's how you use a phone but here i am on a tablet with a screen landscape and it won't rotate there are a few apps that still kind of act like that which i think is unfortunate because they could use this extra real estate on the other hand there's some wonderful apps this is uh, i have an app i use my my email app aquamail which is a great very powerful android email app ends up looking just like a desktop email application. But I have touch. I have a real keyboard. It's very usable. So I, a, a little contrary to some of the reviews on the Pixel C, I actually am going to recommend this. I think this is a great tablet. If you know somebody who needs a tablet, they don't have a strong preference for iOS, maybe they use an Android device or they like Android, I think this is an excellent choice. I've been very happy with it. Uh, and I feel like more and more apps, especially now that Google's kind of done this, more and more apps will take advantage of the extra sideways real estate, because, have more tablet -y interfaces. The one thing really missing, and, and this I agree with the reviewers on Engadget and The Verge and other places that said this, it, it unlike the iPad, when the iPad Pro came out, Apple added the ability to split the screen into two different windows of varying size. Which is great because you can have one window could be a browser, another window could be uh, you know a, a word processor. You can take notes, or and I like that, and I it, it helps with multitasking. I do wish that uh, Android would add that. In fact, the uh, Pixel C team, which did an AMA on Reddit, they didn't ask me anything on Reddit when this came out, said that's in N. The next 
I don't know, Nutella, Nougat, I don't know, the next version of Android N will have split screens. And we've seen some evidence that that's, that was intended for Marshmallow but didn't come out. So if that's the case, this may end up being kind of the sleeper. I really, I feel like this is a uh, very powerful tablet, very fast. It's the first to use the new NVIDIA X1 processor, which is a great processor. And I, I feel like this... Uh, this is something you should look at. Now, I don't, is it in stores? I don't know. I suppose it will be in the Best Buy and places like that. But I wanted to make sure people heard that this is good. If you're looking for a tablet, if you have somebody you're buying a gift for this holiday season and you're looking for a nice gift because it's expensive with the keyboard, we're talking a lot, Pixel C, something to consider. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Number of people in the chat room saying, well, geez, for. 650 bucks or 750 bucks i'd rather get a laptop and absolutely absolutely um this is a you know we we're talking about the pixel c tablet a little lighter a little uh more portable but there are some great laptops out there i love the macbook the 12 inch macbook that's a lot more expensive that's about 1400 bucks uh somebody's mentioning the new dell xps 13 i have earlier this year version of the xps 13 that's a great windows 10 machine although if price is no object i'm really loving the surface book with the pen I really love that. Or even the Surface Pro 4. So if Windows 10 is what you're interested in, I think there's some very good choices as well. Kind of it's interesting now, isn't it? We have some operating system choices. The thing I don't like that's bugging me is that all the companies now are really working extra hard to lock you into their ecosystems. You know, when it, in the good old days, 10 years ago, uh, you, you kind of could mix and match, couldn't you? You could have an iPhone and a Windows machine, maybe an Android tablet. You could mix and match. You could buy stuff from Amazon. Now they've really incented you, kind of, I think, over-aggressively incented you to be either all, all Apple or all Windows or all Amazon or all Google. There are advantages to doing that, but I have, but I, I have a feeling it's just not to our advantage in the long run. It's good for them. <laughs> very good for them and the incentive is well everything just works better together doesn't it and google but what you're seeing is anti-competitive behavior google going so far as to say well we're not going to write any applications for windows phone and apple saying well we're going to phase out all the google programs and that's bad for us it's nice to have choice and lock-in is the opposite of choice all you can choose is one company that's your choice and once having done that now you know what phone what desktop what tablet you know you, got, you know it's all done for you what cloud service? 8888 ask Leo. That's the number. Actually, Microsoft may be the exception there. Microsoft, which traditionally <laughs> is the lock in company, kind of. Apple invented it. Everybody looks at Apple and said, look how well they're doing. Microsoft is, of all the companies, being the friendliest to the other guys. They even went over and sang a Christmas carol to the Apple store. Did you see that? <laughs> Heather, ha uh, Heather Hom is not here today. It's Kim Schaffer in the, uh, in the phone booth. <laughs> Well, normally uh, you guys switch off, but but we Heather. We like to keep you guessing. Yeah, Heather's decided to make you work all weekend long. I did the same to her last week. Yeah, it's fair. <laughs> Hi, Kim. Who should I? Uh, she's been lining up the calls okay. as I've been going on and on. Speaking of being locked in or not locked in, I think you're going to help Sam spend some money because he wants to buy an unlocked cell phone. And oh, he wants you see, a... you see, you see what I'm saying? All right, thank I you. Want some opinions. Thank you, Ms. Schaffer. Hello, Sam in Santa Monica. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. How are you? I'm okay. Okay. Um, uh, I'm looking to get an unlocked cell phone in in the budget price. Um, and I, I've, I've heard you talk about the Moto G, and I've been researching, and it, and it, and it, it looks nice. Uh, I, I've come across a couple others that have uh, that are a little more feature rich. And see if you've had any experience with them. One was the uh, Huawei P8 Lite, mm -hmm. and the other is an Alcatel uh, Idol 3. Okay. So first, let me explain to those who are listening what you what an unlocked phone is. Sure. Because um, there's all sorts of different things you can do to kind of free your phone. The the, the locking you're talking about is what's called carrier locking. And when you buy a phone from AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, uh, they make it be that that phone will only work with that carrier. So you take the SIM out for an AT&T phone and you put in a Sprint 
sim and the phone will say uh, no i don't think so now there are limitations on what they can do they've gotten kind of in trouble for doing this and most carriers will under some circumstances unlock it for you that's nice if you travel unlocked is nice because you have flexibility right absolutely uh, yeah but you don't and what you they, lose and they, is and they make them so feature rich to compete right which i like right right um, I don't. I'm not familiar with either the Alcatel or the Huawei. I have a Huawei phone, the one they make for Google, the uh, Nexus uh, uh, 6P, and it's it's excellent. I think Huawei makes very good. The Huawei's I've played with make, are very good. I don't well, know. you know, the, the, this phone is pretty good, and it's, it's in the same price price range. It, it's got a 32 gigabyte uh, storage. More storage is got, nice. I don't think 16 or 8 is enough. So 30. Well, but you know, they both have uh, the, the you know the SIM cards up to 100. Up to 128. Uh, the SD card, yeah. So that's nice. Yeah. yeah. Which beats the Moto G, which will only go up to 32. I know. But again, you know, sometimes we look at those numbers and say, well, I have to have the most and maybe never mm -hmm. use it, right? So right. It, it also has, interestingly enough, and I mean, I don't travel as much as you do, but, it, but the Huawei has a double SIM. Yeah. That's an interesting feature. Um, I had a OnePlus 2, well, still do, that has two SIMs. Not much use in the U.S., but the idea is the phone will sense which area you're in, and this is mostly necessary in India and China where there are many, many, many different carriers, cell carriers, and as you move around, even from a few miles, you may be in somebody else's territory. So the phones will automatically recognize that and switch over. So, right. uh, yeah, I mean... I guess for travel that would be useful because you'd preserve your old number and you could use a, the, a SIM from another country. So uh, right. maybe. <laughs> I have yet to I use mean, it. Maybe worth something, right? Yeah, it's yeah. worth something. Yeah, uh, worth something. I understand it's not aimed at the U.S. market, but it, maybe, you, maybe you could find some value in it. They also, many of these phones have FM radios for the same reason. Nobody in the U.S. cares if our phone has an FM radio, but they apparently do in other countries. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, a couple of them do. <laughs> I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I just, uh, it's interesting. Well, so, the, the other really, I mean, cameras to me aren't as important to you. They all have 13, you know. 13. Yeah, where they fall down, and that's with an inexpensive phone, one of the first places it falls down is cameras. It's cameras and storage are the places they give up. Cameras Usually, and storage is probably battery life. I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, you know, sometimes that's a push because they're using slower processors and lower resolution screens, and so they don't mm. drain the battery as fast. My Moto G got very good battery life. You love the Moto G, right? Well, I haven't tried those other two, but I think the here's why I, I would probably prefer it. It's going to be the purest Android experience, and it's right. most likely for that reason to get updated. And with Android, you really do want to get updated because, yes. uh, for security reasons, it's it's fairly important. So I don't, I, I'm not saying I don't know anything about the Alcatel and Huawei in terms of updating, but I do know that Motorola, formerly a Google company. Uh, is very likely to stay uh, tight with Google and update fast. And for that reason, they keep it a pure Google experience. I also, I mean, in 19, uh, what was it, 94, I got my first cell phone. It was an AirTouch, but it was really a Motorola. <laughs> yeah, remember. Motorola's one of, is pretty much invented portable cell phones. Exactly. So exactly. they've been in the business a long time. Not that you benefit from that, but it's kind of, you know, it's a nice tradition. Well, I, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I, I mean my, my father would only buy, you know, Ford. So. Yeah, yeah. Those days are long gone, aren't they? <laughs> so the camera on the G is not great. I would take a look at sample images. You know, you can go to Flickr and search by camera phone model and look at images, not, you know, hyped up images, but real images from real photographers and get a sense of the weaknesses and the strengths of each camera. None will be perfect, but you want to find one that will work best with you. I think any of those three probably be fine. Absolutely. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Oh, oh, Slack. I'm going to do a little ad for one of our fine sponsors for the podcast, a great company called Slack. It's all, it's the, it's the new hotness. Do you know about Slack? Oh. Slack, I mean, Slack was created by Stuart Butterfield, uh, the guy who wrote and created Flickr. Uh, and he decided, you know, with his vast experience in development, that teams could do better than email. So he created Slack, a messaging app for teams. We've been using it with our, well, a perfect example, our web dev, web dev team in Austin. So they're in Texas. We're here. We developed a whole new website. And we stayed in communication, had regular meetings, you know, shared files, shared everything through Slack. It's better than email, 
it's permanent. You know, you can go back in time. You can do that with Slack. You can search through the uh, the message tree. It's pretty. It's enjoyable to use. It's really a good-looking, easy-to-use, very well-designed tool. A lot of teams transition to Slack from, you know, cobbled together, you know, email, instant messenger, Skype kinds of things. It's all in Slack. You put them in one single organized searchable view so you can get decisions made faster. Transparency is improved. But you have complete control. So you can share your Slack stream with a third party, but they, you know, you control what they can do and for how long. And you can drag and drop to share files, images, PDFs, documents, spreadsheets. That's really sweet. And integrations with Slack and other tools are incredible. Dropbox, GitHub, Trello, MailChimp, Google Drive Hangouts. We used it with uh, um, GitHub and uh, Atlassian's Jira, and uh, it all worked beautifully. And, of course, there's apps everywhere, iOS, Android, Mac, and Windows desktops. Companies all over the world, not just companies, like NASA uses Slack, MIT, The Wall Street Journal, Salesforce, Zappos, eBay, Dow Jones, Airbnb, Expedia, Intuit, Samsung, Spotify, Pinterest, Twit, everyone uses Slack. Slack surveyed their customers about the impact Slack has had. They reported 32% productivity increase. I'd vouch for that. 48% reduction in internal email. I'd say it's even more for us. Just basically eliminated email. And this is my favorite one. 25% fewer meetings. You don't need to because everybody's always on Slack. It really cuts through the communications quagmire. And now you can try it for free at slack.com slash tech guy. Plus, we'll give you $100 credit towards a paid plan if you decide to convert. Slack.com slash tech guy. Really a beautiful, sweet solution. Slack.com slash tech guy. You'll be part of the cool kids. Brian says, we use Slack at work. We're concerned about the persistence of info. You know, we had that issue. Uh, we were on Slack, and I was giving, I, they said, okay, we're going to do the crypto now, the SSL. And I said, all right, I'm going to give you the keys, but I'm worried about it sticking around. And they said, no, 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 don't worry. You give us the keys, we'll, we'll, we'll in, do it, and then we'll delete that, and you have total control of that. So the administrator can eliminate conversations, completely control that. Control is the key on Slack. What's interesting is a Twit fan has created Slack uh, room for Twit, which is kind of cool. I don't know. I don't know. You know, for like Twit fans, he said, "I got the I got the invite yesterday." I said, "All right, I'm in." I don't I don't know what to do with it, but <laughs> I should decide. Should we make it like a little? We could use it as a chat room almost. I don't know. Want I don't want to proliferate. The chat room is in that little screen over there. Okay, how, how much do you use them? Oh, I'm, I have a little screen right here. And I have that one there. I'm always, I'm always looking at the chat room. Yeah, it's kind of like the buzzing voices in the back of my head. I never got the priv. Oh, I think I had a hallucination that I bought it. I was sure I bought it, but you know, sometimes you can go through the whole process, and then something you press a button, and I bought it, and then maybe they come back and say, "No, you didn't," but you didn't see that. I don't know. Because I, I realize now I never got an email from BlackBerry. I never got any acknowledgement, and I never got a phone. Did I do it on Did the air? Did you pay for it? N uh, not that I can. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's what you have to find out. I should, look through, I should look through my credit card statements and see. Yeah, my suspicion is no. Thank you, bzz, bzz, Chris Marquardt. I will see you at 1230. So um, I, I'm try now I'm trying to decide, well, should I get the priv or not? The camera is apparently amazing. The pictures I've seen, and the same thing with the uh, Lumia 950. So, I know the Priv looked pretty good to me. But 800 bucks? It's, well, it's pricey. Yeah. Everything's expensive. Yeah. There's everything. It, you know, and you know, I didn't keep the Moto G, because it, it, it's it's yes, it's under 200 bucks, but it feels like it's. <laughs> It's good for it's good for under two hundred bucks. So when somebody says what's a good value camera, I could say it's a good value or good guy value phone. But am I going to use it? Me? No, I need opulence. So I'm, it's funny because I'm back on the iPhone just because of the battery life. How do you like it? You, it? Did you get it all working for you? It, I think so. 
for the most part. But the battery life is amazing. It is. I, I can't, it's astounding. I was here all day yesterday, yeah. and it was still at 100%. Well, when that's a here. flaw. <laughs> it's I'm, a flaw. But I'm at 97, <laughs> percent and I'll be I'll I'll go to bed. It'll be 40 or 50 percent. I mean, that's I'm at 98 right now. Yeah, isn't that awesome? It's great. Yeah, that that part I love. Well, that's all I love. <laughs> There's little things that just gall me. Like for instance, you can only have so they have folders. They didn't have folders for years. They finally got folders on iOS, but you can only an app can only be in one place. Oh. On Android, an app can be in 12 different folders and on your desktop. You can organize it as you want. Apple's so freaking the, the rigid. The lack of personalization They're is what so bothers OCD. me. They're so OCD. But um, like, make other than that. aliases, please, Apple. It's You have it on the on the Macintosh. How hard is that to do? And it's not, but see, I would, for instance, I have apps that I would like to have be in, you know, travel category and the money category or whatever. Just because then it'd be easier to find it. But no, Apple says no. You can only have one and only one copy of any icon. No redundancy. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a little frustrating to me. Maybe I should go uh, go buy a Priv. And this time... Really bought. Hit submit. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I hit submit. That's what's so weird about it. That's what's so very odd about it. Okay, choose color. Well, I'm glad they give me a choice. Black... Or black. Um, I could buy it from Amazon. Let's see what Amazon... Uh, see, I could get it tomorrow probably from Amazon. Not eligible for Prime. Well, that stinks. Um, I wonder if I could get it for from Prime. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK. Leo's the number. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, coming up an hour from now. Day and I'm gonna yell at him because he talked me into buying a film camera. What? Next it'll be a turntable. Then I'll grow a goatee and wear a little hat. Be a hipster, hipster film guy. Dave is in Riverside. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Dave. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm doing fine, thank you. Hey, look at I got a. I'm, I'm Dave, sure you're not really from California, are you? <laughs> Where are you from originally? Originally, I'm from Michigan. Originally. Oh, okay. Detroit, yeah. Motor City. Motor City. Well, look at the. Uh, I have my uh, laptop here, and I have a Windows Seven. And now I'm getting more and more where it pops up, and it says, "Hey, download Windows to Windows Ten right now, free, and a limited time offer." And I heard you before saying, uh, "Curse you, Microsoft! You and your ads." But I'm really happy with Windows Seven. Oh, now this is a tough one for me. Okay, so Microsoft is signaling to you. Yes. Not, not by the way, very s subtly, signaling to you that your machine is compatible with Windows 10, and if you want a free upgrade, you can have it. Now, by the way, uh, that will continue, <laughs> as far as we can tell, until July 29th of uh, 2016, at okay. which point that offer goes away. Uh, and then you'd have to buy it if you wanted to go to Windows 10, which means you have now plenty of time to think about it, at least seven months to think about it. Um, if you like seven, all right, let me tell you why you should upgrade, and then I'll tell you why you shouldn't upgrade. <laughs> you, sh you should upgrade because it's, well, it's the latest version. It's two versions later, which means there are improvements. There's, it's more secure. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think... They really screwed up Windows 8, and, and, and Microsoft was humbled, frankly, by that, and went back to the drawing board, listened to customers, and Windows 10 responded to customers' criticisms. Okay. Um, and so they, I think they've solved a lot of the problems. You know, the problems I had with Windows 8 was it was trying to shoehorn a tablet operating system into a desktop operating system so that you would have the choice. And, in fact, a lot of new Windows hardware is both, right? You can detach the screen, and now it's a tablet. You put it back on, and now it's a laptop. Some people want that. You, do, you don't sound like that a tablet kind, tablet-y kind of guy. No I, no, I got a laptop. You want a desktop operating system. Yes. And frankly, Windows 7 was the best version of Windows ever. They I did a great Windows. job. It is mature, so the reason not to upgrade it to 10 is it's new which means that support of older hardware could be spotty and in some cases non-existent. 
It means there will be new kinds of bugs and flaws and issues, which Microsoft will fix, but they, people who upgrade to 10 are facing, you know, as you would expect, face new problems. Whereas Windows 7, been around, what is it, eight years, they've updated it and updated it, they've patched it and patched it. It's probably more secure just because it's been banged on and all the flaws have been found. Uh, and it's uh, it's pretty rock solid, isn't it? Yes, it is. And support for the it has un indubitably the widest support for our hardware and software of any version of Windows because it's been around. It's now at some point Microsoft's going to say, and that point is probably a few years off. I'd have to look at the table they publish a table of end of lifetime for every version of Windows. At some point they're going to say we're not going to update this anymore. That point is certainly three or four years off. So you, at that some point, you're going to have to make the decision. You maybe want the free version now. Now, here's what you might want to try. This is one option. Wait till July. <laughs> well, you can roll it back. If you accept it and install it, they put a button in the control panel that says, go back to my previous version. Okay, I like that. And you have 30 days to do it. Oh. doesn't always work. So my suggestion is make a backup uh, system, you know, like an image backup of your Windows 7 machine before you do this. So you could go back. By doing that, you're accepting the offer, you're locking it in, so at any time from now on, you can go to Windows 10, even after July 29th. You're, lo you're saying, I accept, I am going to take Windows 10. Even rolling it back does not turn it off. You now have it. So you, can, you now have a choice, 7 or 10, whatever you want. You could even do both if you wanted with a dual boot system. I, I think, you know, enough people... To, Windows 10 is good, and I love it, and I've been happy with it, and I haven't had any problems with it. But remember, I don't know what the latest count. The last time Microsoft told us 111 pe million people, 111 million people had installed it. It's the most successful rollout of all time of any Windows version, of any operating system I know of, 111 million wow. installs in just the first few months. And, of course, 1% or maybe one-half or one-tenth of 1% have problems. That's still a million people. <laughs> so a lot of people are reporting problems with it and I see those problems and I hear from them because they call me and, and complain so I do know that it's not perfect so you may be one of that small percentage I don't I can't tell you one way or the other Microsoft is kind of saying with the existing hardware and software you have we're not you're not going to have a problem okay so uh, what is my advice you know if it ain't broke don't fix it stick with Windows 7 if you really felt like, I want to preserve flexibility. By the way, this the real problem is this annoying ad is not going to go away. That's true. That's that why I call so it. it really peeves me. Um, there is a way. It's a particular uh, hot fix that you can uninstall that will get rid of it. And But then Microsoft <laughs> reinstalls it with their updates from time to time, which is, I think, unconscionable. I think that Microsoft needs to be spanked. That is, that, that's not okay. If somebody doesn't want Windows 10, you don't have the right to continue to harass me. That's bullying. <laughs> that's bad behavior. You know, I, I said I don't want it. Go away. So somebody in the chat room has looked up the Windows uh, 7 end of life, and it goes to 2020. So you have to November 14th, 2020. Many people are still using XP without harm. <laughs> so that just means that's when you start to think about it. Um okay. I, you have at least seven months before you have to decide. If you Google, if you go online and Google, and you know what, I'll put a link in our show notes, techguylabs.com. There are instructions for how to get rid of this very annoying pop-up saying, please upgrade, why don't you upgrade, why don't you upgrade? It's a really good thing, you should upgrade. Yes. Get rid of that, because that's just annoying. Uh, I would stay with Windows 7 if you're happy. Everything works, right? Everything works fine. No problem with Windows 7. Yeah, you're not going to get any issues. It's, But Microsoft... So you, so the question asks is, why is Microsoft being so pushy? They would love everybody to get to Windows 10 because then developers are more likely to develop for Windows 10, take advantage of some of the features of Windows 10, including, and I think this may be the, what, the real reason, making their apps work on Windows Phone, which has unfortunately been dying on the vine. Microsoft spent billions of dollars on this. And so they would like Windows Phone to have an installed app base. So they're hoping, well, gosh, if we can get 500 million people using 
Windows 10, maybe developers, at least a fraction of them, will do this Windows Universal thing, and then their apps will work on everything, and on Xbox One, and on Windows phones, and on Windows tablets, and the world will be a better place, and we'll be rich. <laughs> so I think stick with what you got. You, it's not in your interest that Microsoft's doing it. It's in their interest. Gotcha. Okay. Great. And uh, I'll put in the show notes, uh, I'll, I'll Google it during the next break, and uh, find, I think my friend Paul Therott, who writes a great uh, blog about Windows and is the host of our Windows Weekly Podcast and who is my Windows guru, I think he's put instructions on his site. You could Google that, Therott, T-H-U-R-R-O-T-T dot com, uh, removing the Windows ad or something like that. And, and somebody's saying in the chat room, and it's true, if it's free, why not download it? You can decide later. And it's true, you can roll back. It's just that that's a little bit risky because if the rollback doesn't work, you're stuck with Windows 10. And, you know, I mean, it is nice to have a free operating system. That's why 110 million people have installed it. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. And let's see. Gail is on the line from Covina, California. Hi, Gail. Oh, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Share. What kind? Um, my Well, see, I, I, I fool myself into I'm doing a good thing. It's dark chocolate covered walnut. What could be? Oh, full of antioxidants. Yeah. Micronutrients. And here's the good news. They've just discovered walnuts have fewer calories than they previously thought. Oh, well, there you go. I can eat an extra have one. Have another one on me. <laughs> you, know what I, you know what I love? But I okay. can't. Butterscotch squares. <laughs> Try them. Okay, oh, good. no, that's not good for you, though. <laughs> no, but cho dark chocolate walnuts. Mm, mm, mm. Ah, good. Uh, okay. Last week, I heard you talking. Uh, there was a woman asking about e-readers. Yes. And you mentioned, but I don't know if I'm hoping it was a Kindle. You said that there is an e-reader out there that you can be uh, reading. And if you get tired of reading... You can switch over to audio and yeah. it's right up from where you are. Now, which e-reader is that? Kindle. It is Kindle. Yeah, but you have to, but not all books do that. Okay. So oh. when you go to Amazon, because yeah. Kindle's Amazon, right? And Audible.com, which is the uh, audiobook company, is uh -huh. Amazon. Some of their books are enabled for that. And I, 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 trying to remember the name i thought it was whisper sync i can't remember anyway oh. you're gonna, it's going to say whisper audio or whisper sync ready on that book and okay. they give you a discount so if you buy the book on the kindle they'll give you a discount on the audio book if you buy the book on the audio book they'll give you a discount on the kindle book so it's it, you have to buy both but there's they're less expensive and i did this as i mentioned to her last week with a wonderful long book called The Goldfinch, which I loved. last It was last year's summer book of the year or whatever. Right. And um, it was fun because you could go back and forth. You could be reading it on the Kindle. You could even, it would even on some Kindles, Kindles with audio, it would read to you while you're reading the text. So you, it would highlight the text as she's reading it. So for early readers, this is great because mm -hmm. you get a young adult book and have them. So let me look. Real quickly, I'm going to look in the gold. Yeah, because I'm, okay, so, um, and it syncs it. I mean, the web's the word, the whisper Yeah, it says, so they call it whisper sync for voice ready. Okay. So you'll see that on the book, on the Kindle book, or you'll see that on the audio book. And then they, when you buy one or the other, they say, oh, and here for a special deal for $9, you can get the other one. Okay, but which Kindles do that? That's what I need to know. All Kindles do that. But oh. not all Kindles will read out loud to you. Right. So That's if you don't have a Kindle that reads out loud read to you, out you out. put the Audible app on your phone or whatever has a, a speaker on it, mm -hmm. and then you can do it. And any and by the way, uh, any Kindle app on Android or iOS will also do that because they're on devices that have audio output. It's just some of the less expensive Kindles don't have audio. Okay, so, so they any can. Kindle any that Kindle with audio. audio any Kindle with audio, uh, and that's the more expensive ones, right. not much more. I mean, the, Amazon really discounts the Kindles. Or any device, like an, a, a smartphone, that has the Kindle app on it. Do you have a smartphone? 
I have an iPhone. Perfect. So get the Kindle app on the iPhone. Uh huh. And when you buy, you can Amazon doesn't let you buy in the Kindle app because they don't want Apple to take thirty percent. So uh, you have to go to the Amazon site, buy it, download it to your phone, and you download both. Now here's there's one little weird thing. Okay. On the Kindle app, you download the audio book in the Kindle app, not in the Audible app. It's okay. A set, because the iPhone stores things in in a inaccessible directory to other apps, you have to download it in the Kindle app. So let's say you bought the Goldfinch on Kindle, and then mm -hmm. you go to your iPhone, you look at your library in the Kindle app, and you see Goldfinch. You click that, and then if you if you buy the audio app, you'll also see download the audio. Now, when you're reading. You can say, play the audio while I read, and it'll highlight the sentence as it reads it. If you're reading and you say, and you stop, and you then start listening to the audio book, it will say, you want to pick up where you're left off, and you say yes. So you can get in the car and have it read to you till you get home again. Okay. It's called it Whisper will Sync. Also, for it it'll, will also do that very same thing on the Kindles that have yes, audio. Yes, that's right. And, uh -huh. I, and I'd have to look on Amazon to see which Kindles those are, but you can see. It'll say in the description. Okay. That Probably the paper white will do it. I don't, I'm not sure which Kindles have audio. Okay. Yeah. That is just amazing. I know. I continue to be amazed, even though I've been using all these things. You know, unfor if you're not being amazed, you're not paying attention. But the problem is we're just all kind of used to technology, so we just all take it for granted. Yeah, but we live in a world of wonders. <laughs> We really do. And sometimes it's you got to step back and think. It's that great, if you've not seen it, Louis C.K. bit that he did, I think it was on Conan, where he says, everything is amazing and nobody is paying attention. And he talks uh, about flying in an airplane. You're six, you're three, what if eight miles in the air, it's going 300 miles an hour, and the food is cold. And you go, why is the food cold? <laughs> I can't make a phone call. It's very scratchy right now. And yeah. it's like everything's amazing and we take it for granted. We do live in a world of wonders. Yes. So yes. I'm glad you noticed. It was Jimmy Kimmel. Okay. Yes, uh, look for Louis C.K. on Jimmy Kimmel. It's a very I will. it's a very funny bit and you will go, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is true, isn't it? It is. I'm just gonna mention just real quickly, thank you for the information on Kindle. I really appreciate that. But I just bought a Fitbit and it tracks my sleep which I am just amazed. I'm amazed again because <laughs> how many times I'm restless during the night. And it's like, wow. No, it's not I good news. <laughs> I'm not sleeping at all. <laughs> it's terrible um, news. It's, it's amazing. I had, uh, there it was a company that unfortunately went bankrupt, uh, but it was called Zeo, Z-E-O, and I was able on eBay to buy some uh, remaindered Zeo headbands. It measures your your electrical signals. You put it over your forehead while you're sleeping, uh -huh. and it tells you how much deep sleep, how much REM sleep, that's dreaming, mm -hmm. how much restlessness, and how much awake you are. And it's not based on motion. It's based on brain waves. Uh -huh. Very, But it's interesting because it's very close to what the Fitbit says, which is only mention, m monitoring motion. Yeah. And it is. It's depressing. You get really your, the deep sleep, which is the healing sleep you need, I get maybe 15 minutes a night. No, I thought, no wonder I'm waking Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I probably, I'm losing 20 IQ points every day. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks for talking to you. Take care. Thanks for your call. We live, I'm, you know, I, I can't remember. It's Jimmy Kimmel. It's probably safe for radio play. I should play this Louis C.K. bit. I'll listen to it off the air first, just to make sure it's clean, because he's not, he's not famous for, for working clean. But it is a very funny bit, if you get a chance to see it. It's on YouTube. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We're only a minute left, but let's, uh, we can get started with Walt, and if you'll uh, hang on through the top of the hour, we'll finish up. Hi, Walt. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, about a letter I got in the mail from the United States Office of Personnel Management. OPM. Yes. They had a major hack. If you have ever applied for a job with the government or ever worked for the government, th your personal records may have been lost. This is not a hoax. And they did they offer you one year of free uh, credit reporting? <laughs> no. It uh, says... Uh, I can take advantage of the uh, ID of your monitoring service. Do yeah, and but it's not enough. They give you one or two years. I can't remember what they do. But yeah, enroll with the ID yeah. experts. Yeah, no, that's not a that's that's not a hoax. Well, 
Hold on a second, because I've got to take a break. We'll finish this up when we get... Yeah, this was a terrible deal. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about Epson, shall I? This would be a good time to uh, mention our wonderful sponsor. Uh, and I'm sincere when I say that, because I am an Epson fanboy. I have been back since my uh, Epson dot matrix days. Remember the MX80? I even had one of those Epson laptop computers. I, uh, I've had many Epson Seiko printers, you know, the label printers. They're, they're a good company. And I've followed them all along. I had Epson laser, Epson inkjets. Then they came out with the Precision, the Workforce Pro with the Precision Core technology. I got that immediately. 40 million drops of ink per second. It's the best laser, uh, inkjet printer I've ever had. Best printer I've ever had because it's laser quality text, brilliant colors, super fast, like three seconds a page, v -v 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 silent, no warm-up time. The one I have is all-in-one scanner. And now, man, these guys are good. The Eco Tank printers from Epson. These printers don't use ink cartridges. They come with a tank that includes, I don't mean, I mean, includes two years of ink. It's in the box. So like this, the ET4550 has 11,000 black pages, about two years of ink in the box, or 8,500 color pages, equivalent to about 50 ink cartridge sets. And when it comes time to put new ink in, in a couple of years, in 2018, easy peasy. Very economical uh, ink bottles. You just refill it. And you get all the precision core technology, fast printing, two-sided printing, 30-page auto document feeder. These are great all-in-one printers. Wireless printing, too, which I really like from tablets, from smartphones. Supports air print and uh, it's all the different technologies. Epson has its own cloud print technology, Google cloud print. These are amazing. I love our printer. And now, 50 cartridges worth of ink in the box. You have the freedom to print, my friends, without running out of ink. Epson.com slash Ecotank if you want to learn more. Transform the way your home, your office, your work group prints. The best combination of ease and value and ink. Lots of ink. The Epson Ecotank printers. EPSON.com slash Ecotank. I just, this is, these guys, they keep, they're innovators. They keep making it better and better and better. Best printer I've ever had. We thank Epson for their support. Epson. Exceed your vision. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, all that jazz. 8888 Ask Leo. Actually, our photo guy, Chris Marquardt, coming up in about half an hour. Uh, phone number 888-827-5536, ask leo It's also uh, possible to reach us via Skype if you're outside the uh, U.S. and Canada. Toll-free number means toll-free Skype call as well. Our website is techguylabs.com. Now, we were talking uh, before the break, and while I, I appreciate you're hanging on, news knows no wait. Okay. Waits for no man. So Walt got in a letter from the Office of Personnel Management, OPM. Now, of course, uh, this OPM hack is very well known, and that means bad guys could also be sending out similar letters attempting to hack you in some form or fashion. But this is true. The OPM was hacked, the Office of Personnel Management. If you uh, ever applied for a government job, not even got it, but applied for a government job, your application was on record. If you were ever, and this is what really scares me, if you were ever vetted for a security clearance, you know, yep. when the FBI comes to you and your loved ones and asks you questions and makes notes, all of that material was also hacked. The OPM hack is, in my mind, one of the worst hacks ever. The Chinese government says it wasn't us, it was Chinese bad guys. They actually prosecuted some people. I think it's an attempt to cover it up. But this is a legitimate concern for you. I have a friend who is a mailman, a mail carrier. He got the letter because mm -hmm. he had a government job. So take this seriously. Now, don't, however, <laughs> if the letter says send us $300, don't do that. No. <laughs> go, go to the website, the Office of Personnel Management website, which is opm.gov. And uh, you'll see some information there. Or if there is a link in the letter to an OPM.gov page, go, you can go there. I, well, I tried that. And uh, one of the first things that popped up was a page 
asking for every piece of my personal information. Yeah, no, that's a don't do that. <laughs> but unless then, you're on the opm.gov site. Yeah. And uh, the, the letter that I got, you know, when I look at it carefully, some of the uh, wording is kind of a little bit off. Oh, that's a, then you got a hoax letter. I'm glad you, you had the good sense to say, hmm. Yes. You didn't fill that form in, did you? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, now, no. Here's the thing. When you go, if, you, if they give you an address and you go to that address, you should see HTTPS... That S is really important, colon, slash, slash, www.opm. Look at it carefully. Make sure it's not yeah. zero p.m. Yeah. Opm.gov, not .com, not, not .cn, but, which is the Chinese TLD, opm.gov. And if it says HTTPS and it says opm.gov, then you're on the official site. And they may legitimately say, I would, wouldn't be surprised if they legitimately said at that point, uh, yet to see if you were in this breach, we need to know something like your social security number. That might be legit, but don't ever give that out unless you're really certain you're on the right side. Yeah. Well, the the address that they give on this letter is that uh, slash uh, cybersecurity. That's the correct address. It is. Okay. Yeah. That's the correct address. And then if you really want to know, in your browser, you can click the, you know, there'll be a padlock next to the HTTPS. You can cl click that link. And look at the certificate and see if, and it's, it should say your connection to this site is private. It should say, uh, you know, you should be able to view the certificate. The identity of this website has been verified, all of that. So okay. you want to make sure all of that is true. But, yeah, it's it would be reason. I'm not surprised that they would ask for some information because they want to verify that it's you. Yeah. Uh, before they do anything else. So they may well ask you for your social, your address, things like that, to verify your identity. Yeah. But don't give it, but you're right to be, boy, I'm so glad you called, Walt. You're right to be suspicious yeah. uh, because that uh, hackers know about this stuff and they go, oh, hey, yeah, this, this is low-hanging fruit. Let's send random letters out, see what we can get. Well, the letter was addressed to me at the right address. Yeah, I think that's probably and right. And it is OPM, not zero PM, the letter O, the letter P, the letter M dot G O V yeah. dot slash cybersecurity. That's correct. So manually enter it. It'll pull you there. Make sure you get the HTTPS. Check the certificate. This is all prudent before you give out any personal information. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Were you a government employee? Uh, yes. Back in the 60s, I worked for the FAA. Yep. They got your stuff. I had a... This is an appalling hack. I've had a government security you have uh, security clearance clearance since well, so, early 60s. So as you know, in that interview, the FBI asks about all sorts of personal stuff. Oh, yeah. And, and here's the thing that really appalls me. Even if you were refused a security clearance, let's say you're gay, and the government decided, well, we're going to refuse him a security clearance because he's gay, that's in your record, mm. and the hackers got it. Even if you didn't get the job. Oh, I had a I'm not. A, I'm not insinuating anything about you, Paul. Or yeah, well, not, and not that there would be anything wrong with that. But I'm just saying yeah. that there's personal, very highly personal information about people that may have even caused you to be declined, and it's still in there, and it still got hacked. Okay. A shocking, shocking. Yeah. Uh, failure, frankly. I have a couple of suggestions. If, yes, if please. Uh, I'm WB6 Tango Whiskey Victor. W six T W T, E W V Victor. Yeah, no, I'm W six T W T. Yeah, whiskey so six tango, boys. whiskey ta whiskey tango. Say again. Uh, anyway, uh, I said yeah, we're close. Yeah. Uh, it's about Yagi antennas. Oh, good. Uh, I and and in, in my work for the uh, some of the largest uh, uh, aerospace companies in, in the U.S., I had to do a lot of work with antennas. And uh, uh, a Yagi antenna is not really a good TV antenna. Oh, that's good to know. All right. So you might want to talk to some of your uh, ham friends. And not all, I'm not saying all, all hams know about antennas. Well, here's a ham that doesn't, actually. Yeah. But what I do tell people is go to antennaweb.org. Yeah. 
uh, and they have recommendations based on your zip code. So they know when you enter the zip code there, they know where oh, the yeah. television antennas are, where you have to point your antenna if you have to point it, and and they have also antenna recommendations. So yeah, Yagi may not be the best. Well, Depends on the band and so forth. Yeah. Well, you know, from the first time it was mentioned on your show several years ago, uh, in the show notes, uh, it led to a Yagi antenna on uh, Amazon. Oh, that's a, okay. We'll fix that. Well, there were two. The, the, the following that, the first time it was recommended, I think it was a uh, Yagi antenna for uh, uh, Wi-Fi frequencies. Okay. And the second time it was uh, oh, something else. Uh, but neither of those would have been the right frequency for TV. Good to know. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, that's why my standing recommendation is not listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> no. Listen to Antenna Web. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> and, a good one. yeah, and they know, and the reason especially is they can tell from your zip code what exact frequencies you need. Part of the problem is that. In different areas, different stations are. Some of the stations are still on VHF. Some have gone to UHF. It really varies. Yeah. Well, here in Los Angeles, uh, channels 7, 9, 11, and 13 are back on their original VHF frequency. Right, right. And my son tells me in Philadelphia area, I think their channel 6 is back on. Right. And that's part of the. That's why I recommend Antenna Web. It's it's a moving target. It's different in different locales. Of course, we're heard all over the United States. So I I I whatever I said was wrong. <laughs> Thank you for the correction, Walt. And make sure you go to Antenna Web if you're if you're trying to get an over the air antenna. Yankee would be appropriate in certain situations, but not all. It's omnidirectional for one thing. Hey, thanks for the call, Walt. Walt, do check out opm.gov. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I don't know. You're asking the wrong. Are you a ham? Yeah. Now, what is a Yagi? The point of a Yagi is... those. Yeah, I know what they look like. It's, t it's tunable. It's tunable. Okay. So you might want a tunable one, right? Yeah. So that's... And because, especially because some now some stations are VHF, some back on VHF, some are on UHF. It's, of course, the, you know... The FCC screwed it up royally, basically. <laughs> they wanted that 700 megahertz spectrum back. Yeah. Well, they didn't screw up. If you think about it, I mean, what they were saying was appropriate, but it ended up really making a mess, a hash for TV viewers. Um, they, they, you know, But they, I understand why they wanted to get these analog stations. Analog is not a good use of spectrum. So they wanted to get these stations off analog so they could recover some of the spectrum. I mean, we have, if everything were digital, we'd have much more spectrum. We'd have infinite spectrum, practically. But, you know, the, no, no TV station is going to voluntarily give up its transmitter and its tower and start over. So I understand what they wanted to do, but it sure made a mess of it. Yagi is directional, but tunable, I guess that's what it is, right? Yeah. And then I think Python is a language of choice for those hackers. Python's a great language. Um, and hackers often are not very sophisticated. They don't have to be. They don't have to be. They're script kiddies, yeah. So um, it really just varies what they want to do. Some hackers are, are still are working in, in good languages like C and uh, C++ because they're writing Windows code or they're writing, um, you know, they're writing executables. And then some hackers are, uh, you know, writing bit brute force. They're writing, if I were writing, for instance, if I were writing uh, something that was running on my system, I probably would use Python. But if I'm writing a brute force attack, I want speed. I might even write that in assembler, right? I might want to get that as fast as possible. So, yeah. But Python is a good – Is I love Python. Yeah, it's a great language. Well, for what you do, it's great because of PyNum and all of the great libraries. That's its real strength. We had Larry Wall on triangulation, and uh, he's talking about the new Perl 6. And I said the problem is you have CPAN, which is this – if you ever used Perl, the library is available for Perl because it's been around so long are phenomenal and they have this amazing directory called cpan and you move to Perl 6 all you're breaking all of that infrastructure python even though he went to python 3 at least the python libraries are still good pynum is like i mean i know it's a yeah yeah no i think everybody i know that does heavy math in science and uh in statistics would use python yeah 
NASA uses Python. Google loves Python, although they've moved to Go a little bit. That's their new language. But Go is for cons concurrency, so that it's really a networking language, right? Because they want the concurrency. Yeah, you, use, yeah. yeah, you wouldn't need to if you're running on a single machine. It's not an issue. But if you had a big cluster, it handles concurrency well. I was just reading a great article about how hard it is. This was a great article to do a file system, to like do a safe write is so much harder than people realize, mostly because modern file systems are crappy. <laughs> they don't do a good job. This is a very deep subject. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, files are hard. It's from Dantu. And um, the premise is that because file systems are so poorly uh, written that they just don't handle errors and crashes very well, and you're almost certain to corrupt a file in, in a great many cases. So he's talking about well, you could do, you know, an F sync, but the problem is you've got out of order writes on some file systems. You have to make sure that it's, you know, doing writes in order. And I mean, it's incredible. It's really, it was just fascinating. It was far worse than I would have ever thought. And he talks about all the modern file systems, mostly Linux. But do you guys work on Linux mostly, or well, I mostly use Windows? Windows? Why not? I prefer, I prefer. Yeah, because I like the command line, and yeah, yeah, yeah. The support's easier, I think. You know, you can, yeah, yeah. I love Python. I really love Python. C was my first good language, but uh, Python I came to early because it's so C-like. It was very easy. Yeah, love it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. I was reading uh, up at the Office of Personnel Management, opm.org/cybersecurity. Uh, on this breach, they, it turns out there's about a million people, a little more than a million people, who had records in the OPM database that were hacked. They can't reach them. They don't know where they are. So if you, <laughs> so here's a tip. <laughs> even if you didn't get a letter, but if you ever got a government cl government clearance or applied for one, even if you didn't get it, if you ever worked for the the U.S. government, you probably should go to opm.org slash cybersecurity. They're looking for you. And, uh, and, of course, the latest news is that uh, the Chinese government, which uh, it was pretty much agreed, I think, that the OPM hack was the work of the Chinese government. Chinese government says, you know what? It wasn't us. Turns out, oh, who knew? It was some bad guys in China, and we've arrested them. Oh, well, uh, yeah, we're safe now, right? <laughs> Nothing to worry about. Thank goodness. Elliot Boston, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Elliot. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, well, I just purchased a uh, hover domain, Elliot'sWorld.Tech. Congratulations. You're going to have a website, Elliot? Is that what you're going to do? What? Are you are you going hard of hearing? You're too young. Are you going to have a website, Elliot? Uh, yeah, in a bit. Okay. What can I do but for I you? I was just wondering, uh, how do I set it up so that my uh, so that my email will go through it? I have a I have a Gmail. Yeah, so I want to here's, it here's so that it, it's exactly I what I do. It. So you want people to write Elliot at El, what is it? Elliot's World Tech. Yeah, it was on sale from fifty bucks to fifteen. Great deal, good deal. So you want people to be able to write to actually anything at elliotsworld.tech, but Elliot at elliotsworld.tech would be a good start. Um, then you go to Hover. It's not free, by the way. And you say you yeah, want email free. redirection. I think it's $5 a year per mailbox. It's not very expensive. And yeah, then, I already bought that. Yeah. Right? And, then you, and then you tell it, and it says, well, where do you want it to go? And you say, I want it to go into my private, don't give this out, my private email address on Gmail. And it goes, boom. The difference is you're not storing your email at Hover. Now, you can buy email service from many people, many domain uh, registrars. That's what Hover is, including Hover. That's more expensive. That means the email will go to them. They'll store it just like Google does with Gmail for free. For a fee, they'll store it. They'll let you access it. They'll get set up an IMAP server that lets you get your email and so forth. But you don't need that. In fact, I wouldn't recommend it because G Google does a great job, an amazing job for free. And you have web access. You can forward mail to it, which is what I do. Um, so that's the best way to do it. So go to Hover.com. Get your special domain. Mine is 
I, in fact, that's at Hover. Uh, they're a sponsor. It used to be a sponsor anyway. Leoville.com. And then I just say, well, my mail goes to these addresses at Leoville.com. Please forward it. And you can have multiple forwardings, by the way. So uh, my mom has an address at Leoville. My kids have an address at Leoville that, that they can have forever that will forward to whatever service they're using at the moment. Mm -hmm. And is there a way that I could make it if I send an email from Gmail? Ah, mm -hmm. good question. Because you don't want it to show your Gmail address, do you? Nope. You want it to show Elliot at Elliot's Tech World dot Tech Tech Tech. So, <laughs> or something yep. like that. So, uh, yes, that's called in in the Google world. It's called delegation, and it's in Dele the delegation. And, oh, and it's in the. Uh, I just noticed the Google's. Uh, New uh, loading this page on Gmail is a lightsaber that fills up with light. Wonder how much Lucas oh, paid not, them for. Are you on the light side or the dark side? Uh, apparently, I'm on the dark side. I don't know. How did I choose that? Which one are you on? I'm on the light side. Oh, we can't talk anymore. <laughs> no, I'm going to give you some bad advice. So, young Padawan learner, <laughs> what you need to do <laughs> is go to the settings. <laughs> In the settings, you're going to look at, uh, let's see, is it accounts? I can't remember where it is, but it's delegation. You'll say, when I send, I want it to say it's from Elliot at Elliot's Tech World dot tech. Okay? It's just in the All settings. All right, thank you. Simple enough. Now, listen carefully. Those aren't the droids you're looking for. Roger, Lomita, California, Leo Laporte. The tech guy. Hi, Leo. Hey, Roger. Hey, uh, I, I don't have perfect vision, but I got a good memory. And about three weeks ago on air, you did say you ordered a Prev from somewhere in Canada. I know I did. It's driving me crazy. It's from somewhere. It was from Blackberry in uh, Waterloo, Canada. They make the Priv. Now, did you did you see me press the send button or the submit or the pay button? Because I, I don't know. I, I'm not getting it. I don't. I. It, but then I realized. Well, I never got an email, so maybe I forgot to press the buy button. Uh -huh. okay. I'm ordering anyway. one right now, just in case. Great. Anyway, if I get I two pribs, I'll call you and uh, send it over. Okay. I got. Uh, I talked to you about a year ago. I'm a senior with poor vision. That's slowly getting worse oh dear and i want to i want to buy an ipad pro and they're now they're out so i wanted to know your opinion on number one is the pin just for drawing or is it for any other use on, on it it could be used in any way for touch so anything you could do with your finger you can do with a pen oh okay so i should get one i well uh i mean I've, uh, it depends on what you want first of all it's very 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 expensive it's outrageous apple shame on you 950 dollars Base price, and then you right. have to spend a hundred bucks for the pen. If you want the keyboard, that's another hundred seventy bucks. Right. So let's see. I'm now up to like twelve hundred bucks. I'm, this is what a computer costs, but it's pretty cool. It, for for low vision, it'd be good. You can make the text bigger. You'd be. It's a big screen. It's twelve inches, so you'd see it pretty well. And if you like to illustrate, draw, handwrite notes, the pen does. There's nothing like it. It's beautiful. Okay. Now for the keyboard, is it is it lit or not lit? There's two, and it depends what you buy. The Apple keyboard is not backlit. Okay. But they also sell a Logitech Creative keyboard. It's 20 bucks less than the Apple keyboard, and it is backlit. Which would you recommend? Well, it depends. I bought both because I'm an idiot. Okay. Um, and the advantage of the Apple key, at first I poo-pooed the Apple keyboard. 20 bucks more and it doesn't do as much. Who would want that? But it's thinner and lighter. So if portability is a concern, the Apple keyboard is really a good choice. And you know what? It's a decent keyboard. However, uh, the Creative Keyboard has special keys for iOS, which the Apple keyboard lacks. And it has backlit, which I think is great. It has function keys, which I think is great. And it's 20 bucks cheaper. It's just bulkier and heavier. Does it cover the whole uh, it does. iPad like the Apple it's one? It's a case. Okay, okay, good. Unlike the Apple one. The Apple one only covers the front. The back is exposed. Oh, this one covers both. Oh, it okay. covers, it's a case, which is why it's bigger, bulkier, and heavier. It, it, you know, you have to jam your iPad Pro into the, the Logitech keyboard uh, case. It's a full case, and it makes it look huge. <laughs> However, it's protective, and it is a much better keyboard. If you want the best keyboard, if you want the backlight, yeah, get the Logitech. Okay, great. 20 bucks less. Now I have both. Hey, thanks for the call. I buy it so you don't have to, Roger.
And Elliot, I find your lack of faith disturbing. <sighs> Our show today brought to you by Blue Apron. I love the Blue Apron. You know I like to eat. And lately, uh, I've been very conscious about my health, and I've been trying to eat healthily. I am so glad we have Blue Apron. BlueApron.com slash twit. The idea of Blue Apron is to give you all the ingredients you need to make an amazing meal. The meal plan's done for you. The menu's done for you. All you have to do is get the ingredients in their beautifully refrigerated Blue Apron box, and it comes with a recipe card. Plus, if there's techniques you need to know more about, the Blue Apron website has videos. And you're making an amazing meal, an incredible meal, from scratch, fresh, all the ingredients are fresh, including the meats, the fish in that refrigerated box. I am just a huge fan of Blue Apron. And, of course, because I become more uh, health conscious, I'm, I'm, I'm changing my diet a little bit. Blue Apron works with me to make sure that it gives me exactly the meals I need. They have vegetarian meals, gluten-conscious meals, all sorts. You know, I mean, everything. You can buy a plan for two. Uh, which is great for date night, by the way. You want to impress a person, uh, make them a delicious Blue Apron meal, they'll say, wow, I had no idea you could cook so well. Now kiss me, you fool. They'll all, <laughs> they also have um, uh, family plans with family-friendly ingredients. Delicious stuff. Go to blueapron.com slash twit. See what's on the menu today. Uh, things like Italian meatball soup with farro and lacinato kale. I never even heard of lacinato kale. That's the nice thing about Blue Apron. You get these ingredients... Like those purple potatoes right there. You never maybe would ever have. But once you learn about them, you go, these are good. I'm getting more of that La Sonato kale, whatever that is. How about lemon bucatini with Brussels sprouts and toasted breadcrumbs? Oh, baby. Oh, my goodness. So here's the deal. Go to blueapron.com slash twit. Your first two meals are free. You completely control the deliveries, the menu plan. But they never repeat. So you're always going to get something new. And I think you come out of this with a renewed confidence in your ability to cook. You don't have to be a cook to know how to use Blue Apron. But after you do, I think you'll feel pretty good about your abilities. By the way, all the produce, all the ingredients are farm fresh from local businesses, family-run businesses. So you know you're getting great stuff. Ingredients, like I said, I've never seen before. But that's what's great about it. You're really, it's kind of a cooking school in a box. Don't We don't want to say that because I don't want to scare people off. But I got to tell you, I feel like, man, I can cook some good stuff. Let's see what else is on the menu this, um, this week. Roasted acorn squash and farro salad. See, that's a good one for me. That's a nice vegetarian meal. Mushroom and Swiss chard quiche with Gruyere cheese and arugula salad. Arugula! Where have you been all my life? Spiced roast chicken and collard greens. Learning how to make collard greens right, boy, that is a skill. And if you can do it, life will be good going forward maple butter and thyme look at those collard greens there's a trick there's a trick you got to learn how to make them they use thyme butter apple cider vinegar oh this looks so my mouth is watering blueapron.com slash twit your first two meals are free give them a try today and we thank them so much for their support my, my, my mouth is really watering oh <gasps> want you and then you can say oh yeah i'll take that recipe that looks good. And then it's in your box. So look, this is the leftover Lego from the Google thing. I made a speeder. <laughs> I was so mad at Google. Hey, Chris Marquardt. Hello. How are you? I don't you? know if I want to give him a hard time for this or not. Maybe I do. So Google sends us a gift. It's free. What should, you know, this is like Louis C.K. Everybody's, everything's amazing and nobody's happy. So if you're a Google Fi subscriber, which I am, they sent me a little present for Christmas, a little Lego thing that you can make a little Lego charging stand. But they don't send enough pieces to make the whole thing. They only... S <laughs> so I can make the charging stand, but then there's supposed to be a cable thing, a cable holder that you're supposed to make. But they, they And in the map, this, these are, this is supposed to be solid green, and I didn't have enough, so I had to use some of the olive pieces. It's like, what the hell, Google? <laughs> if you're going to send me some, I know it was free, but don't send me like half of the but, kit. But isn't Lego such a, such a nice and creative toy that you can come up with your own design? Yeah, a speeder. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> so you bought a new camera. I got an M3 from your friend in Austria. 
Uh, it's not my friend, but, uh, well, but they're be. reliable. Yeah. yeah. No, I actually, <laughs> I invoked your name because I bought it last weekend. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. No, and I, they I never said they're I, my friends. I, I got a confirmation, <laughs> but they didn't send the camera. So like a week later, I'd send them a note saying, hey, you know, I, I, I Chris Marquardt is a friend of mine. He recommended you on the radio show and I'm uh, looking forward to getting my M3. When is it coming? And then I get a note back saying, oh, you'll get it Monday. <laughs> so I get it tomorrow. That's good. That's good. And M3 in pristine condition. Well, B plus condition. That was the best they had. Well, B, I, th I believe they actually I think kind of over deliver. Honest. Yeah. I think they over deliver. Well, there's yeah. not going to be. It's The camera's older than me. I'm not. I'm not in B plus condition. There's not. There's. It's unlikely that the camera would be in A A condition. Like if it was never used, maybe. The M3 is 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 I'm the so the the smoothest I'm best so built excited. Leica ever. Yeah, and if it's not in great condition, I'll get it rebuilt. Oh, Did you read uh, Ken Rockwell's article about it? Yes. Oh, that's what made me buy it. <laughs> Ken Rockwell said this is the best camera ever made and ever will be made. Don't even think. Entitled. He titles it as the world's greatest 35 millimeter camera. Yeah. yeah. I am so excited. I bought four rolls of Tri-X, four rolls of Ilford HP5. So I got a one, oh. ISO 100 and ISO 400. I bought a special strap. Oh, this strap is beautiful. Um, is it like a thin leather yes. strap? You uh, are turning into a hipster. I'm a hipster. <laughs> no, I got to show you, you this. You need a pipe now. It's, it's so beard. beautiful. I saw this on another camera blog, the Henri. Ooh. It's handmade. It's only 70 bucks. It's not very expensive. Ooh. It's basically made for Leica, as you can see. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> it's a hipster strap. Yes, yes, sir. And so I ordered that. I got that. Um, I got my... I, oh, this sold out. Ooh. Uh -huh. I'm lucky I got it when I got it. It was on Amazon. And, you probably uh, mentioned it on the show, and now everyone got yeah. one. I got it. Oh, there's four left on Amazon. Run and get it. The Henri. <laughs> and, but only uh, if you have a Leica. It's so, it comes in this beautiful box. It'd be a great gift. It comes in this beautiful wood box. No, any small camera. If you had a Sony, it'd work on the A7, something like that. It, it's, a, it's a small camera. Um, and then uh, I got the metal lens cap. I couldn't find my metal lens cap. For my, so as a true oh, hipster. I, I lose my lens caps apps yeah, all the time. So I got another metal lens cap. It says Leica. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That code of Chrome song signals it's time for our photo guy, Chris Marquardt. He's here from the Viewfinder Villa with the latest camera news. He is the devil. You got me to no, buy. No. You got me to buy a film camera. Chris leads. Uh, of course, Chris is a digital photography guru. I mean, this guy. You know, he's uh, he he is uh, wonderful. Does workshops in digital photography and everything. But he also somehow I don't know how went wrong somewhere. And uh, got into film photography as well and uh, does some workshops on that. We got to talking. Fortunately, uh, I got talked down from the $3,000 medium format film camera. But I was able to find a very uh, good condition camera that's actually older than me. A Leica M3 that uh, I did. I bought. You made me, get, you made me do it. Yeah, I feel guilty. No, actually, I don't. I don't. <laughs> this is your, this is your gateway drug into the world of film. I, uh, sh is. I shot in my in my Ute in my misspent Ute. I shot film on a Nikon FM, man, very manual camera, which I loved. Uh, and I would roll my own Tri-X in a big black bag, and I'd develop it and print it myself with a Bessemer enlarger, the whole thing. But uh, that was many years ago. I sold all my equipment a long time ago. So I'm going to, I'm going to, but I, you know, I, I kind of buy into what you're saying. And I see nowadays, even on Instagram, I see people posting digital scans of their, of their black and white film shots. And there's something oh, and, and that's them. the way to go. That's the yeah. way to go. The hybrid approach. You can, you can shoot on film. It really changes a few things, uh, how you approach it, how, how much value you actually attribute to your work, because it is worth more at that point and then um yeah scan it or take pictures off of it and then and then invert those um so you can pretty much uh, get get both the best of both worlds the digital world the the analog world yeah. kind of together so and the other thing that's kind of interesting this is the historic historicity of all this so oh, and you and you bought a, like like one of the best cameras 
it's, ever it's built. It's kind of a legendary camera, right? It is. It is. The Leica and, uh, M3. And it was only 800 bucks. It's not, they're not that, I mean, it's expensive, but they're not like that expensive. This camera is older than I am. <laughs> came out, it's, it first came out in the early 50s. Uh, they made it for about uh, 10, 15 years. But I got an early one because it's a double pump. You know, it's like <laughs> you double, double, double stroke, double stroke, and then uh, <laughs> and, which means uh, you have to pull the well, harder the work twice. To harder is good. The film. Yep. Uh, and then, um, but it's been well preserved, and so you know that somebody bought this, and it, when it came out in 1954, it was hideously expensive. So some really serious photographer bought it, probably a hobbyist like me, and uh, with more money than sense. And then took good care of it because it's in good shape and handed it down. Probably his son inherited it, didn't know what to do with it, sold it. Who knows? It's like Black Beauty. Who knows how many lives this camera's been through, right? And Oh, and it's kind of it, cool. It, it must have some interesting history. You you bought it from Europe. You got it uh, sent to you from Austria. It's coming from Vienna. Places, so. It's coming from Vienna. So straight I'm going to make up place. a story in my mind about some little Viennese shopkeeper who was a camera buff but no one knew and he took Probably many a picture true. nobody ever saw brilliant photography someday he'll be discovered like vivian meyer and uh, i have his camera that's my story that's, i'm sticking with it that's the story yeah make a note <laughs> of the serial number and maybe we'll, yeah we'll but find it check it out yeah, yeah anyway th thank you for for being a devil but a good devil you convinced me and, <laughs> well talk to me in a few weeks it's like 80 I will, cents. I will. It's 80 cents a shot. And you can't tell if you got a good shot until you get it developed and printed. Of course. <laughs> It'll be, you know. <laughs> That's the fun about it. You will you will find yourself looking at the back of the camera a few times until you go, oh wait, there is no preview. I know. Yeah. This will be fun. Anyway, that's good because it makes you uh, slow down, right? Oh, but it slows you down. It makes you it makes you it makes you appreciate the value of photography a bit more because now you have to work a bit harder and yeah we are all we we human beings are all about convenience right right make everything simpler for us automate everything but that pretty much also means that we lose a lot of skills we lose a lot of uh techniques that we used to have that make us better in what we do and yeah. with photography that really brings back a lot of these things and um by by forcing you into a few things and i mean just just a simple act of manual focusing means not just that oh now you have to work no now you have to make a conscious decision what to focus on yeah. before your camera would make that decision for you and it would be right most of the time but maybe sometimes it would be wrong because it didn't know your intention now you make this an intentional uh, act and how could you uh, simulate this if you had a digital point and shoot but you want oh, you to can, force you can, yourself to kind of do this process what would you recommend well, you can you can with uh, many modern cameras. Um, you might have a focus ring on the lens if it's a camera with a lens like a like a, a mirrorless camera or an, or a DSLR. And when you set that to manual, you can manual focus, so that is clearly possible. Um, but you could also just make that conscious decision by switching off the fully automated uh, made it focusing and just switch on what most professionals actually do: switch it to the center focus point, so it only uses one of those. 200 focus points that it has um which kind of feels like a waste but now you are making a conscious decision right you right. you point this one focus point at where you want the focus which might not be that face of the person but might be uh, something in the foreground on the table for example which the camera would automatically never have focused on and now you focus on that you have pressed the shutter you then move the camera to how you want the composition to be full press the shutter and then it takes the picture with the focus where you wanted it to be you could also move the focus point around some cameras have that little joystick on the back where you get to like you see that in the in the display a little red dot that moves around the uh the 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 frame that you have and, and pretty much determines where the camera is going to put the focus so you have some control over these things and that's that's what a lot of the photography is about to gain control back because the cameras are wonderful. I mean, 90% of the time the camera is right. The camera is doing the right thing, exposing and focusing and doing all sorts of things for you. Not with a Leica. But, <laughs> but, 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 but then there are these 10% where the camera is completely wrong. Wrong. It doesn't get it right. It gets the focus wrong. It's right. exposure wrong. Now well, you winter is coming snow. up. You, know. you talk about snow photography. The camera is rarely right when Same thing in snow. In snow yeah. photography, the camera just sees much white and then it'll darken on the picture and now with these yeah. gray 
snow pictures. Everyone has had those. Um, yeah, the focus, the, the colors. I mean, it's easy to trick uh, or to trip a camera's color detection. You know, every light source has a different what we call color temperature. The a warm evening sun is warm. It's orange and uh, during the daytime it's more has more blue in it and the camera tries to detect that and 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 cater to well make it so that it looks kind of neutral but you know maybe you don't want it neutral maybe you want that really warm sunset or maybe you want that really cool cold bluish shot of something because that supports the story that you want to tell and yeah. the camera just doesn't know your intention so taking back some just a little bit where it's where it makes sense taking back a little bit of that automated um, th that automation in the camera and yeah getting getting a bit more control back that's really that's a very empowering thing and you learn that as soon as you go and play with film i only have one question is there a selfie stick for the leica is there <laughs> some way i could just cuz i would like to do some no, I'm just yeah, joking. Yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, you, <laughs> that's you, actually you the would, reason you get a camera like this. No you selfies. Would need, you would need a long, a long remote release like these with the wire inside. You know <laughs> no, that no, you screw no. on actually, the top. Yeah, and you then screw it in. It's like one of the. It's a you cable. You screw it release. in, and there are long yeah. ones available, so you yeah, could build you could your own selfie you stick. Could do it. Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, the thing about I've learned about photography is you have to experiment. The more you experiment, the better. We have an assignment uh, that will help you experiment a little bit. Was it windy? Uh, it's windy. Yes, windy. the assignment is take a picture. Windy. I'm gonna do or I'm windy. Do, or windy. Oh, I mean, W I N D Y. Oh, could be a homophone. Could be both. Oh, could be both. Oh, so I will do this this time, and it will be in black and white film. I'll send you the print by mail, or you can <laughs> upload it to Flickr and tag it windy. <laughs> Leo Lavoie, the tech guy. <laughs> Windy. <laughs> Who's walking down the streets of the city? No, this is good. I'm going to uh, do a windy picture. Black and white. Windy, windy picture. I'm going to start with Tri-X because I have to say I've been using your light meter app. By the way, great app. That's a nice, um, the pocket light meter is really, uh, it's, it's very it really precise. Is simple. Oh, but uh, by the way, you do know that there is a light meter for the Leica M3. Yeah, I did not buy that because I don't, you know, I don't want to hang that thing off of it. Uh, this it's like a kind of a big, a big, a big thing you put on top. It's a clunker yeah. that you put on the <laughs> top of it. I don't want that. It's also have you, expensive. Have you seen the? Have you seen the flipping, the flipping mirror uh, attachment, the Visoflex that you can get for the yeah. Leica for longer focal lengths? Okay, say, just let's stop right here. Yeah. Okay. By the way, one thing. So, and after reading Ken Rockwell, I, you, John, can I help you? Uh, Chris, a pre-record. Uh, yeah. When we when can we do a pre-record? Okay, so um, so we could do it before the show next Saturday if you wanted. Next Sunday, I mean, I'd have to show up. John's pointing at me. That would work for me. Okay, just so let's often. do it. Um, so the show begins at so, uh, eighteen hundred U nineteen hundred UTC. So here's the thing: yeah. <clears throat> I will also be gone because I will be traveling oh. throughout most of January. So if you feel like recording more than just one segment okay. for some of those that days that I'm not there. Um, we mightn't be able to get all of those that we need, but uh, why don't I come in half an hour early? We can do two or three. Yeah. So I'll come in at, uh, uh, what is it? What did I say? It's 11 a.m. Pacific. That's 1900 UTC. I'll come in at 1830. Next Sunday. Next Sunday. Uh, uh, you come in at, give me your time, 1030. 1030 a.m. Pacific. Pacific time. I'll be here. Okay, great. John, you'll be here, and uh, and I'll be here, and yeah, and I'll put it on my calendar. Good. Thank I will you. be here, no problem. So yeah, then I'll I'll be I'll actually I'll actually be, be for, for on the on the big chaos com, chaos communications congress, the big CCC oh, congress. That's those are the in hackers. This year. Four days of uh, lots of. It's the, cool is stuff the chaos for, computer yeah. club. Is it the hacker club? Yep. Yep, that's, and this, it's one of the biggest. It's it's like the DEF CON, just the European version. I didn't know you were into that stuff. A bit. I'm not a hacker, but I like the culture. So nice. I'm going to be there. So I won't be there on the 27th because that is right in the middle of it. Can you report it. back? Um, to a special version? Live from there? No, 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 no. It doesn't have to be live, but just. No, no, no. It doesn't have to be live, but like the next week or the, whenever oh, you totally. get back. Maybe totally. do it on the screensavers. Totally. That'd be yeah. fun. You know Chris from his work as a photographer, but did you know he's also a hacker? I'm, I'm not a real hacker. 
<laughs> I know I know how to adapt a few scripts and things. That's pretty much the extent uh, of it. I would love to get a report from the Chaos um, co Conference. That'd be great. Well, let me let me see what I can do for you. All right, let's talk about it. We'll email back and forth. But I'll but sure. I'll see you a week in a week uh, ten thirty a.m. In a week ten thirty, and then we'll and then our discuss. regular time as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate good. you doing that. So there is a film look. Don't don't get it is not the difference <laughs> between a tube amp and a regular amp, or between vinyl and a CD. No, you can not. immediately spot film. It's because it, it's bad. It's it's grainy. It's contrasty. <laughs> It's it's so bad it's good. Yeah, it has a very different feel. Film, you know, you know film immediately. And, well, I, and I, I have I wanna... not found a I've I you know, Silver Effects is a great black and white plugin, but I don't know of any plugins that can really get that look right. I want I want to get a report as soon as you have yeah, the camera. Yeah, I can't wait. Well, one supposedly it's coming tomorrow. Well, after I told crossed. after I invoked the name of Marquardt, well, that probably scared them to, <laughs> to death. Well, I mentioned that we were talking about it on the radio. That didn't hurt. Yeah, that yeah. helps. Uh, I, I have no idea why. They, they should be reliable. I mean, they no, have I think they're reliable. No, no, I'm sure they're very, reliable. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm sure they're reliable. I just think there. they weren't hustling to mail it. I got to go. Yeah, it's, it's Vienna. It's Vienna. It's winter. Have a waltz. See ya. <laughs> See you next week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number talking high tech with chris in miami hello chris hey Hang on. <laughs> I tell i'm getting you, my I'm own listening. theme played back to me chris uh, well it's right here you see because you know i have to it's not your <laughs> tell me it's not your ringtone just tell me that it's not even my ringtone i wouldn't even go that far <laughs> okay but I do like to have it because, you know, uh, especially on the – it's the weekend. You, you know, know when I hear that guy. song, it's true. Yeah. When I hear that song, my heart starts beating a little faster. Yeah. My mouth yeah. gets dry. Yeah. No, not at all. But <laughs> it's got to – you know, it feels, you know, oh, it's time. That's why you have a theme song, right? It kind of tells you, oh, it's time. It's time for the show to begin. <laughs> I used I to work. I used song. to work with a comic, the great Bob Sarlot. Uh, he used to come on my radio show every week, and he and I would I would drive him crazy because I'd play the Letterman show theme when he came on because he was a regular uh -oh. on Letterman. And he said, "Don't do that. It makes me nervous. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm about to go on Letterman." Oh, jeez, that's crazy. What can I do no, for you? Your happy theme. You have a happy theme. You know, I'm, you know, I'm very loyal, and I've called a couple of times already, and a I couple? really appreciate your Wait a minute. I know. Well, let's get know. the count right. <laughs> A few hundred, maybe, yeah. Is it, is it, Chris, you know what? We're just lucky I don't talk about Whole Foods anymore because that makes me crazy. <laughs> That's how we know you. Uh, well, by the way, hard. while we're talking, credit to Ashley Witt, the, the great composer, Hollywood uh, legend. He wrote that th original theme, and it was remixed later by a listener, and I don't have his name. I wish I'd all go find it. But uh, Ashley wrote that theme, and he did a great job, and we've had it oh, yeah. for 10 years now. It's been my theme. One of these yeah, days i got to send it. Ashley a check. Yeah, well. Yeah, maybe no, we'll all make a donation towards yes. your cause. Yeah, thank you, Ash. What can I do for you, Chris? Well, I just wanted to get some clearance from you on something because always very important. But, um, okay, so now I got in touch with – I actually wrote a letter to Tim Cook's office, and I got a, an email back uh, from Rachel Goodman. She actually works for the higher-end executive team. She hooked me up with one of their senior technical supports. And we did, actually what we did is we, we have a, now a new partition. The new partition, he says, run the new partition for a couple of days. I'll call you on Sunday, which is today. It works perfectly. When I go back on my user side, not my friend's, my friend's user side works good. There's a problem. He says what we might have to do is maybe do a reinstall of the installation of the operating system, but just on top, not like a complete wipe like I did with Yosemite, which I learned from you. Then if that doesn't work, then we're going to have to do a, basically a reinstall from scratch, wipe out the hard drive, do that. Then, if, then what we might want to do is have the Mac taken into the Apple store, have them look at the processor. It's a late 2009 iMac. I'm seriously looking to upgrade now. If not, then I don't know where we're going to go back to the executive team. But I wanted to put all this on the table because you're the person I turn to. I can work with Apple all day, but there's nothing like having you in my back pocket. So you tell Well, me. and this is a good tip for everybody. And most companies, certainly Apple, but most companies now have – an office of the president, or in this case, Apple calls it the executive team. And it's why I tell people, if you're really having a problem, if, of course, you've got to go through the normal tech support first. But if you're really having a problem, uh, write to the CEO of the company, write to Michael Dell 
or uh, Carly Fiorina. No, no, not anymore. Or uh, Marissa Meyer or Tim Cook uh, or Larry Page, whoever the company is, and write to their office directly. And all of them have a team, in many cases a fairly large team, that will take those because they don't want to ignore you. They know that's about the worst thing they could do for public relations, especially if you mention, yeah, and we were talking about this on the national radio show. That helps. Well, it used to be Twitter. I think now they kind of ignore Twitter. But uh, that helps. And then they'll, they'll sign it to somebody, and you'll get better service and support. And you'll often get uh, a, a replacement or something that they wouldn't normally do. In the, it's not part of their regular policy, but just, just because you wrote to the CEO. So it's a good tip, and I hope that this works for you. Keep in touch, Chris. Let me know. Uh, Kevin on the line now from Beaumont, California. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm well. You're sounding great. Thank you. What can I do for uh, you? Uh, well, my question is sort of nuts so much. It's kind of the nuts and bolts of communication is encryption in the technical field. And I know they've been talking to the tech companies to try to get them to weaken encryption, which I'm against them putting something in to make it because that opens right. it up to all the hackers. Always a bad idea to weaken encryption, not because it won't make us more safe. Maybe it will, but it also makes it less secure. And uh, right. not just because of the government, but because anybody who wants to break it. So that's not right. a good I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if maybe we're making it too easy to have encryption because in iOS like 5 or 6, we really didn't have encryption on iMessage. And I'm thinking maybe we've kind of put all these programs out there that put the encryption in there. Maybe they don't need, we don't need so much encryption. Like It's a really interesting point. And my gut would be saying, what are you talking about? But really, it's a good point. And in fact, uh, a point raised by our security guy, Steve Gibson, who hosts the Security Now podcast with me. He'll, let me give you an example. The iPhone. If you buy a new iPhone uh, and you're using the modern iOS, it's automatically encrypted, scrambled. The contents of it cannot be read unless you're logged in, unless the phone is turned on and you've logged in, you've, you've given it your passkey. It cannot be read by anybody. It can't be read by Apple. can't be read by law enforcement. That's contrary to the way it used to be. It used to be encrypted so that a ca somebody gets your phone and a casual guy, he can't read it. But law enforcement could say, hey, we have the perpetrator's phone. They could go to Apple. Apple, please tell us what's on here. And Apple could decrypt it. No one else could, but Apple could. Steve said, that's not a bad solution. Maybe we should go back to that. And here's the argument, and certainly it's what uh, the chairman, uh, the uh, rather the, uh, the head of the FBI, Louis Comey, and others have suggested, is that, is that encryption means that bad guys can do stuff and they can't see into it. With wiretap laws, you can tap a phone, but you, but you can't tap Skype. You can't tap modern cell phones. You can't tap an iPhone because of encryption. And Comey and others say, we need this for law enforcement. Here's the, here's the rub, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, do you trust law enforcement? I, I agree. We want to fight terrorism. Is it necessary? Can you still do your job without it? A lot of, you know, there, there's not a lot of evidence that being able to see everything that's going on helps. And do we trust the government? And there are, in fact, many cases where the overreach on the part of the federal government has intruded on people's privacy. J. Edgar Hoover very famously compiled a dossier on Martin Luther King because he said the civil rights advocate was a terrorist. And they were tapping everything. Illegally tapping everything. A domestic terrorist. Do we want the government to have that capability? I feel that we have a right to privacy, and encryption is an important part of this. But you raise a very important question. And here's what I would say, Kevin, in answer. We need to have this conversation. It needs to be informed. Unfortunately, a lot of members of Congress are not informed as to the basics of encryption. They think a back door is okay. It's not. But we should have an informed conversation. Unfortunately, the way that politics is these days, informed is not a word you'd often use with anybody. But if we could, that would be a good thing. Look, here's the risk. Here's the consequence. Here's the moral hazard. What do you, the American people, want to do? I wish we could have that conversation. Unfortunately, I don't have high hopes for it. 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that stuff with a chip in it. You know, the technology that's changing our lives. Here's what you do you call 8888 Ask Leo. And 888-827-5536. And uh, the lovely Kim Schaffer will take your call. She'll talk to you. She'll get your hair combed. Maybe powder your nose. Just get you ready for your appearance on national radio. And then uh, we'll answer your question. And you'll be part of the Tech Guy enterprise. After the fact, we do put the audio and the video. I, no, we don't have cameras on you. We haven't figured that out yet. If we could figure out a way to do that, I would like to. But uh, then, then nobody would call. Uh, but the audio and the video from the show is then on the website after the fact. Plus, show notes, links, everything you need. So make a note of that, techguylabs.com. We have, a, as often is the case, a great studio audience. James and Christy are visiting from Southern California. And Christy made a good point. She's a, she's a, um, we were talking earlier about audiobooks plus Kindle. And how cool it is because Amazon owns audible.com, which is the biggest audiobook store. And they, of course, they own Kindle and the Kindle bookstore that in some cases, not all, but in some cases you can buy the audiobook and the Kindle book, read the Kindle book, and then switch off to the audiobook. It'll pick up where you left off. You can even, while you're reading, listen to the audiobook. It'll highlight the words as it reads them. It's, it's, a, it's a nice synergy. Um, and uh, she was concerned. She said, you know, do you mean the robotic voice? Because I don't like that. And that is true. When Amazon started making Kindles with audio, they turned on a feature that lets the Kindle read in a robotic voice to you from the book. And I don't like the robot voice either. I don't. And, and publishers, by the way, went crazy. They said, well, no, no, you can't do that. People won't buy the audio book. I don't think that's a problem, really. But that, the publishers complained. So Amazon said, OK, fine. You can turn that off. You can say, as a publisher, no robot voice. Uh, so not all books. In fact, I think fewer and fewer books allow that. But there are some books where you can say, just read this to me. Tell the Kindle to read it to me. But it does it in a, in a you know, it's a computer-generated voice. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. That's different. You, if you buy the audio book and the Kindle book, and usually you get a discount if you buy both, you get the Audible professionally read, very nice reader, plus the text of the book. Um, and I know because, as I said, I do that sometimes. Sometimes it, it, if you're just listening, I, I prefer to listen. That's my favorite way to read a book. If you're just listening and it's like a, a rush, if it's Dostoevsky, if it's a Russian novel, the, the names, it gets a little confusing after a while. Who? What? That? Who's that? So sometimes it's good to, to read along. And the other nice thing about actual reading is you can flip back a page and go, what? Who's that? Oh, oh, oh. That's Fyodor's brother, Pyotrov. Got it. So there is a reason why sometimes you might want to have uh, have both. I, I, I prefer to listen, though. I love listening. It's a great way to go. Uh, Bridget Rancho Santa Margarita, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Bridget. Hi. Hi, Leo. Welcome. I've been listening to you for years, and I think maybe this is the second time that I've actually had, we had to call in. Well, that's what I'm here for. If okay. each and every one of you that listens would call in twice a year, I, I wouldn't be able to answer the phone. So... It's probably good that you always call. You have been really funny just this morning. You've been cracking me up. I think somebody's <laughs> giving you extra sugar or something. <laughs> <laughs> something. Yeah, maybe I had a little too much Christmas candy. Uh-huh. Okay, well, Well, what thank you, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that. I got a deal on a MacBook from about 2009, 2010, and it's my first Mac, so to speak. I love it. But... I've learned that um, I've had iPhones and I've had iPod touches and iPad minis in the past. I'm a big Apple person, but I'm learning now that the apps on an, a MacBook, a MacBook, are um, a whole other world as far as prices compared oh, to yeah. your iPhone. By the way, developers and, for that reason aren't crazy about developing for iOS because they can get five bucks, not five hundred dollars. Hmm. Mm. That was one of the reasons I wanted a Mac so bad, too, is I thought, oh, I know, I'll start making apps. And then I realized after doing some research that it's not as easy as it looks. You mean make apps? You want to write your own? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. 
Maybe. You know, well, the, you the know. good news about Macintosh is that historically Mac owners have been willing to pay for apps uh, more so than, say, Windows owners or Android owners, and they're willing to pay higher prices for apps. So even though it's a smaller universe of people, the people I know who develop for the Macintosh are very happy because they 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 feel like it's a good ecosystem for them to write apps for. So I wouldn't necessarily ignore it. There may be okay. more volume in iOS because there's many more iPhones out there than there are Macintoshes. But as you've yeah. correctly noted, you you know the cost per unit is higher on the Mac side. What kind of app are yeah. you interested in? Uh, I don't know yet. I'm just thinking, you know, I have some ideas in my back pocket, and I have some friends that say, oh, I wish I had an app for this, wish I had an app to do that. So right. it's it's something I'm kind of putting in my yeah. back pocket. But That's called scratching today. your own itch, and it's really the best, <laughs> I think, the best way to <laughs> to write a, an app or best reason to write an app is to, to do something you you want it to do because that's – you know best what it should do, and if well, you and I have friends that it would help them right. too because I I'm a, a post bariatric patient, so ah. if you can have like an app that would log your know, your water, log your protein, do it all in one. Yeah, that'd be great, great. But what I'm trying to do today is I'm looking just for something I can download onto my MacBook. That number one, I'm looking for work, so I need something that will edit a word document just to fix the resume up but okay. once that's done and created i can push that aside so i really don't need to invest in something you know I, if, it, if there's a free app for that yay uh, there is then i'm looking okay and then i'm looking for something that i can perhaps do I, like i'm looking at pages but i'm seeing a lot of the reviews are not looking favorably i like pages i like it don't knock mm -hmm. pages it's not word okay. and that's why the reviews say oh it's not word i mean that's pretty much what they say oh it's not word uh but word is a power tool and what we what we know about word is that people use only about five percent of all the features of word uh, it has, and but the reason it has so many features is there's a different five percent for everybody. So, it depends what you want to do. When you say write a resume, Pages is probably the best tool because it's a really great layout editor as well as a word processor. And and how your resume looks is is of course very important. But here's the beauty part: you don't have to buy Pages. Actually, I don't think you have to anyway. When you get a new Mac, you get it for free. But if you don't have, yeah, if you don't have it iCloud.com has almost all the features of Pages for free, and it's web-based, oh. which means you can use it not just on a Mac, but anywhere, on a Windows machine, on an iPhone, on anything. So you already have an iCloud account. When you set up a Macintosh, when you set up an iPhone, you have to create an Apple account. One of the yeah. benefits of that is if you go to iCloud.com and log into your Apple account, you'll see it has a very competent web-based word processor, web-based spreadsheet, web-based uh, slideshow, keynote, plus all the other stuff, calendar, address, book. And that stuff's been syncing to your Mac and your iPhone all along, so it's already populated. And by the way, it's not just Apple that does this. Microsoft does it, too, with Office 365. They have a very credible... It's more like Microsoft Word, so if you've used Word, you'd probably want to use the Microsoft solution at live.com. But if you haven't used okay. Word, maybe you've used Pages, you'd like the Apple solution at iCloud.com. And, of course, there's other companies that do free web-based word processors. Zoho is very good, Z-O-H-O.com. And Google even has a solution. It's not ideal for presentation. It's really a kind of more about text processing. But Google Drive, Google Docs, it's docs.google.com is also very good. So there's a, one of the reasons these exist is they're all in head-to-head -head competition. I would if you if you think you might be interested in pages for a resume, they've even got a starting start out template and everything. Uh, check out iCloud.com. It's very, very good. 8888 Ask Leo the phone number, Leo Laporte, the funny tech guy apparently today. Hmm? We'll have more right after this. Woohoo! Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. 888-827-5536. Dean Tucson, you're next. Hi, Dean. Hello, Leo. Aloha, Dean. First time caller. I love that. Welcome to the show. Uh, I'm listening. <laughs> hey, I got, look, I got two questions for you, man. Okay, Dean. Uh, what do you think about the Galaxy S4? 
Well, let me tell you about the Galaxy S4, my friend. Yeah, because I've never owned one, but I'm thinking about getting one, a refurbished one, factory refurbished. It should be pretty cheap, like a buck, right? No, it's $171. What the what? That's like old school. That thing is uh, two years old now, the S4. They had an S5 and an S6. You're talking, in fact, the S7 comes out in the spring. You're talking a three-year-old, three-generation old. That should be nothing. In fact, I bet you could go to a store if you're willing to do the two-year term and get an S4 for free. In fact, I bet you can get an S5 for free. It was a good phone in its day. In its day, but for for 179 bucks, I'd get a Moto G, which is brand new. It's 179 dollars, and it's probably, let's face it, a better phone than the S4. Now, if you were to say, well, what about the current one, the S6 or the Note 5? Those are the current Galaxy phones. Very, very nice, beautiful screens, best screens in the market, because Samsung makes them. Uh, the camera, second to none, even the iPhone. I mean, just great camera. Uh, some issues with the operating system because Samsung still insists on glazing over Android with its TouchWiz operating system. Even the name tells you this is going to be pretty, you know, junky. <laughs> oh, it's got TouchWiz. Oh, that's got to be good. Uh, I mean, even the name. It's like, huh? Motorola used to call their skin, their glaze on Android, blur. Yeah, that's inspiring. Take a nice phone, blur it up. Touch whiz it. Spread some touch whiz all over that phone. I wish you could get a Samsung. You used to be able to get a Samsung phone with pure Android on it. You can't. You have to buy it with touch whiz. And here's the problem. First of all, it's not very well written. In fact, Google, it's kind of embarrassing to Samsung, but Google went through the Samsung code that they added to Android and found 13 exploitable bugs, security flaws, 13 in a fairly cursory examination. So you're trusting Samsung to, to modify Android. It also means it's going to take them longer to update it because Google will put out an update like Android 6, the new Android, and now Samsung has to take it. They have to modify it. They have to check it. They have to test it. It's months later before they can update Android. So it slows things down. It literally slows down the phone, too, by the way. It eats battery life. It eats CPUs because it's not very good, not very well written. And finally, the, the nail in the coffin, as far as I'm concerned, is it doesn't make the phone more usable. It's kind of annoying. It gets in the way. There are a few things where you could say, well, Samsung's done a good job. For instance, their browser, TouchWiz, is actually faster than the Chrome browser that comes with Android. It's a very, very fast browser. Nice job, Samsung. Um, the camera might could arguably be better software than Google's camera software. I think it probably is. Uh, I like the control panel, you know, the system settings panes. They're a little more customizable, the quick settings. There are a few things like that. But for the most part, any any additional software that a manufacturer puts on top of Google's Android is going to be a negative. Uh, and TouchWiz is one of those. So, And it was worse, by the way, with the S4. So, no, I don't recommend the S4. Not because it's a bad phone. It was fine three years ago when it came out. But it's it's uh, superannuated. It's old. And it has much a much thicker glaze than the S6, which is much thinner. And Note 5 is even better. I found the S6 to be a little laggy because of TouchWiz. The Note 5, they put more RAM, and it's 4 gigs of RAM. And it's it's a little bit, it's actually very fast. So I bet you if you shop around, you can get a better deal than 170, 180 bucks. But that shows you, I guess, with uh, with that with that, that high a price for the S4, and I, I'm looking, and I guess that's the going price, that that was a popular phone. I just don't think it, it's, I don't think it's worth it. I would get a newer phone like the Moto G for the same price. I think you'd be happier. Moto G is pure. Motorola no longer blurs its phones. They don't do anything to them. Um, cameras as good as the S4 screen? Eh, probably not as good. Samsung still has some great, those OLED screens that Samsung makes. This They call them AMOLED. Uh, aren't, they're not LCD. They're using light em, an organic light-emitting diode that's a, more like a dye than it is a light, and it's really good. So I guess my answer would be no, don't get the S4. You could do better. Walter in West Virginia, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
Uh, hi, Leo. Good to talk to you again. Nice to hear from you, Walter. What can I do? Well, I have a PC, and I've, I've got a shortcut to Google Chrome on it. Mm -hmm. I do have Google Chrome in the PC, but when I double-click on the Google Chrome shortcut on my home screen, I get MSN.com. <laughs> and I don't understand how to get well, Google Chrome. you could just delete it and create a new one. Or you can on Windows, you can right-click on the shortcut and yeah. select Properties. And you can see what that shortcut is actually doing. And in this case... At some point, you installed something that said make, probably something from Microsoft, that said make Microsoft my homepage. Oh. And it modified it. But you can look in that shortcut there. Okay. It'll say, you know, something like C colon backslash programs and settings or whatever, backslash programs and feature backslash okay. x86 backslash chrome.exe. And then there'll be something after chrome.exe that will say MSN. It will, you know, it's, I, don't, I don't know what the switch is, maybe dash S colon or dash s slash msn.com that says make the start page be msn oh so if that's what's going on that's easy to fix now unfortunately there are other ways that microsoft could make that be your home page you should also look in the chrome settings because there is a start page and you can change that oh okay you don't have to have it be MSN. But it's not unusual when you install software. Even Microsoft does this. And you, and they do it kind of a little sneaky. There's some boxes. You, and you just go, okay, yeah, go, 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 go. And there's a little checkbox next to it that says, make MSN your homepage in little tiny print. Would you like to make MS? And you just, you don't see it and you click OK and then it's done. I see. You could fix it. Okay, I'll give you a shot. Yeah. Okay, well, right. well thank you very much. Yeah, who wants MSN to be your homepage? Actually, I... Uh, there's a couple of choices. With Chrome, you don't have to have a website be your homepage, and you might prefer that. You can, for instance, have most most browsers do this. Most recently used uh, sites come up on tabs. Um, you can add extensions. I used to have my to-do list be my homepage, so when I open a new browser, I see my to-do list and feel guilty about all the things I haven't done and probably won't do. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of, you can make you feel bad. There's all sorts of things you can do. You have pretty pictures. Google has a nice extension that will put a fine art pictures on your new tab page it was really pretty so there's a lot of choices that's a chrome extension you don't have to have it be msn in fact it'd probably be the last thing i'd want it to be even if i used msn 8888 ask leo leo laporte the tech guy remember again the website techguylabs.com you don't have to remember anything else if you remember that that's where we put all the links more to come right after this should i get my priv for yeah, but I have Amazon. It looks like it's fulfilled by. Oh, I, think I don't know. Your comment was, I, I feel the need to, to. I want to support BlackBerry. Yeah. yeah. Support well, well, they get the money one way or the other. I'm sure. To, uh, Who else uh, sells this? It's seven. This is six ninety nine. Seven ninety nine from these other two. Well, six ninety nine. That's, that's. Oh, this is Prime. I found my phone, unlocked black. Yeah. I don't need a SIM kit. It's unlocked. That's nice. Um, One-click ordering is not available. Why would that be? I don't know. It's got a big battery. Oh, you know what? I'm ordering. Okay, now watch. Proceed to check out. <laughs> Sign in. What? Enter my two... Oh, I put two-factor on it. Hold on. Oh, no, I'm running out of time. Uh, Amazon. Would you get it for six ninety nine? I might. I might. Only after talking to Leo. Yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Two seven. I, I gotta hear the review. Now that's Christmas music. Ah. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Eighty eight, eighty eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Eight 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 two seven five five three six. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Give us a ring. Let's talk high tech. Sandeep, Orlando, you're next. Hi, Sandeep. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. My question has to do with a program or some sort of app about inventory. I'm helping one of my buddies and his wife. He uh, created a children's Christmas book. Oh, neat. We went live. Yeah, they they it's not moonjumppress.com in case anybody's interested. But What's we it went called? live with the it's a, the the website. It's moon m o o n jump 
You know, I got that. But what's the book? What's the book called? Moonjumppress.com. Oh, I'm going oh, there. Right now. It's, it's it's called No Chimney, No Problem. <laughs> I like it. You know, this solves. Uh, this is this is needed, because many children these days are chimneyless, and we need to explain yeah. how Santa can arrive. I just say he's magic, but I think it would be useful to have a book so that kids would go, oh well, it's got to be. It's got to be the, true. With the the book actually, it comes with this key it's not like a small house key it's a big house key and so you tell your child you know you hang oh. the key at the front entrance oh. and you know we use the key on christmas eve oh that's so house. cute oh <laughs> i love that well that's a great idea so moonjumppress.com you're selling it directly it's independently published which i think these days is probably the right way to go not merely like in an alternative because you didn't want to get a publisher but really the right way to do it um, so she, they need to. Keep, are they doing fulfillment as well? Uh, what do you mean fulfillment? Like, do they do they have like a a box of books in the garage and then? Oh yeah, yeah. So we yeah. So <laughs> okay, we so this is what I would argue against, by the way. But next time, uh, my friend Guy Kawasaki wrote a great book uh, called for self publishers called Ape, and uh, it's all about uh, publishing yourself. And one of the things he suggests is do not. Do not uh, fulfill it yourself. APE stands for Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur. And uh, in there he says, you know, there's a number of, there's many, many companies that will uh, do the fulfillment and even do the printing and will do it uh, on demand, which is really what you want. Because the worst thing is you go to a, a, a vanity press, oh, yeah, no problem, give me $20,000, we'll give you 1,000 copies, you do whatever you want. You got them in the garage, now you're out a bunch of money. You have no guarantee you're going to sell those. If you go to a publish-on-demand company, Lulu.com is very well known, L-U-L-U.com. But Amazon also does this, incidentally. They, they take the order. Amazon would take the order. They would print the book on demand. That doesn't slow it down. They can do it like that. Somebody gets the book, and you don't have any excess inventory. I, I know this is not your question. I'm just... For future reference. Oh, that's good to know, actually. For future it reference. A, a second edition. By far... Yeah, once he gets the second edition... By far the best way to do this. The old way comes from the the old days of vanity publishing. And really, the business of vanity publishing was there's an author. He wrote a book. It's the worst book ever. Never going to get a publisher. But he's got some money. Great. No problem. We, the Vantage Press, was the king of this. We will publish this for you. We'll give you a lot of copies. You buy the copies. It's up to you to sell it. And then we get a, you know, poor guy's got 10,000 copies in the attic. Uh, and it's a pain, and he's got to do mailing and all of that. You don't want to do that. So Amazon has their own uh, unit that does this. Uh, in fact, I think that's what Guy recommends in his book, Ape, How to Publish a Book. But there are lots of other companies that will do this, and it's a, it's a much better way because you're not out any money. You don't have to mail anything. you got happy customers. And by the way, customers are happier buying from Amazon than they are buying from you because they never heard of you. Right? Yeah. So uh, as I, as I as wonderful as this more. is, uh, but uh, if I go to Moon Jump Press and I press buy, I don't know who these guys are. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of resistance, natural reluctance. So next time, yes, second edition. Second edition. <laughs> but now he's got a problem. So because he's got an yeah, inventory, so have, he's got to do fulfillment. Fifteen hundred copies <laughs> sitting in the basement. And we looked at QuickBooks, which has an inventory function, but obviously because we're new to this, we don't have the capital to just pay for that. Is there any app or any program that you know that's either cheap or free that would be able to manage our inventory? Uh, I'm going to mention a sponsor at this juncture that you really need okay. to know about uh, called Stamps.com because you're going to have to ship these too, right? <laughs> So you're going to print the, the uh, stamps.com. Uh, again, they're a sponsor, so disclaimer here. But what they do is they will do all of the stuff that you need, including, I'm pretty sure they have an integration. You're going to use U.S. Postal Service, which you want to use because media mail is a lot less expensive to mail a book. Now it's close to Christmas, so you may have to be overnighting that, but they'll also support that. They work with companies like ShipStation, that will make it easier for you to keep track of inventory, to ship it out, to respond to customers, um, and they you they you you don't have to go to the post office ever. You know they print the postage, the the mail carrier comes and gets it. Anybody's doing something like this, fulfillment is your biggest pain in the butt. 
inventory and fulfillment. And that's why we do the other thing. But now that you're <laughs> stuck with 1,600 copies, first of all, congratulations. You got a great big plug on the national radio show. And, and actually, looking at this book, you deserve it. It looks really great. Thank you very um, much. But yeah, so you don't, what you want is kind of an online inventory fulfillment solution. It's because it's not just keeping track of the books, you got to mail these guys. Yeah, true. They even do it. They'll even do the e-commerce side of it. That sound looks like you found a solution on the website. So give me a plug again. What's the name of it? Moon. Moon, as in like the moon in the sky. Jumppress.com, and the book is called No Chimney, No Problem. Uh, and it comes with a beautiful little key on a green ribbon. It's adorable that you hang on the door, and then Santa can get in. No problem. Yeah. I love the idea. Yeah, this is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This is a challenge. Uh, and I'm glad to give a plug to my friend uh, Guy Kawasaki, ape, author, publisher, entrepreneur. He's written a great book. You should read before you do the publishing thing. Because you really don't want to be out all that money. You don't want to be stuck with the inventory. But we don't need to anymore. Technology allows us to print on demand, as sold. Somebody buys the book, then you print it and ship it. Much better way to go. Uh, Teddy, Southgate, California. Hi, Teddy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Thank you for taking my call. Oh, uh, thanks for calling. So I have a 2013 uh, Hyundai Sonata I bought for my daughter. I've had it for two years. I'm going to give it to her because she graduates uh, this coming year from, from high school. What a great gift. That You are a good dad. That's a nice gift, and it's a safe car, too. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, on the steering wheel, you know, you, you have all these buttons. One is to answer the phone. One is to hang up. And one is to uh, uh, make it do commands, right? Yeah. So when I bought, my, when I bought the car, I, um, I had it uh, connected to an iPhone. Hmm. I no longer have an iPhone. I have a Samsung Galaxy Note 4. Oh, and it's got the iPhone connector on it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it has an iPhone connector, but it, but it's okay because I don't need that connector because obviously I can set it Wi-Fi. So when I hit the button now, and it used to say "please say a command," now when I hit the button, now it just it just makes it sound like like a thonk. That's it. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't do anything. So then, it's confused. It says, "What is this? What is this device? What is this Android device? I don't know what to do here." Yeah, I want, I want it to be able to, when I push the button, I want it to be able to say, please say a command and, and understand that I have a Samsung now instead of an iPhone. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Who made the, who made the head end that you're using? Is it from Hyundai or is it uh, aftermarket? No, it's, it's original. It's, it's Hyundai. It comes with the it's yeah, Hyundai. you know, you got me. Let me, uh, I'll tell you what, we're running out of time anyway. I'm going to do a little research. What sound does it make again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to look that up on the internet. How do you spell it? <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, yeah, the Hyundai, I'm surprised it worked at all. So it sounds like Hyundai had some Apple integration built into it. And it's going to be it's going to be dedicated to Apple, right? It's going to require an iPhone. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's funny. This has been around for a while. This uh, this kind of uh, you know, Apple and I uh, and uh, Android both now have, uh, you know, Apple Car and and Android Car interfaces. But that's only on new machines. And so Apple did this kind of uh, thing for a while mm -hmm. that a lot of cars supported. But I I don't know how you get the Hyundai to support uh, Android. Because I was thinking maybe I should, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm basically using up all my, my thinking. I'm like, maybe if I disconnect the battery and then... No. And then, no? No. I, you paired it in, it's Bluetooth pairing now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I, okay. Most so of the, gonna, most everything will work. It's that, it's that command to the phone that may be specific to... Yeah. Right, the one that says, please say a command, that one yeah. doesn't work. It Everything works. else works, though. You play music on the phone, it should play in through the Bluetooth. You paired yeah. it, right? Yeah, everything works. You know, I would ask a Hyundai dealer. They may have a firmware or software update that would make this work with Android. Well. I know uh, you don't want to spend any more money on this car. 
because you're giving no, it. But um, I'm gonna give it to daughter, right? And she she has an iPhone, by the way. <laughs> so maybe I should just leave it alone because obviously she has an iPhone. Yeah, don't mess with it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the, the Android. I don't, you know, my answer is I don't know. A Hyundai dealer would know, but I don't know. It's, it's, it sounds like it's iPhone specific, and this has been around for a while. There's, uh, and so you may just have limited functions. You can, with just pairing it by Bluetooth, you can do all, you know, you can play music through, but you have to pick up the phone, and I know you don't want your daughter to do that. I don't want to pick up the phone and then get a big ticket like. I agree. <laughs> I agree. No, I understand that. Um, it's up to Hyundai to support it. All right. All right. You can get a third. I mean, if you don't want to spend money, this is not the solution. But you can get third-party head ends. You can replace the stereo in the car with ones that that are that both use Android and iPhone. There's, mm. they, they support CarPlay, the Apple solution. And uh, but, I love, but I love my stereo, the one that came with. The yeah, car. you don't want to mess with it, and you shouldn't because the, the 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 that's more valuable, frankly, the dealer installed or the yeah. the manufacturer installed. Um, right. I don't know. I, Hyundai would know. And if I'm, I'm at, we're, I'll ask the chat room. Maybe if they have a solution, we'll put it in the uh, website. Okay, sounds good. All right. Hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Musical director Nathan Staten, again, hitting it out of the park. Thank you, Nathan. We put the Nathan's playlist for each and every show on the website, techguylabs.com, right at the bottom of the page. It takes a little while because Nathan's got to write it down, you know. And then we have to scan it into the scanner and try to figure out Nathan's handwriting. But by the time... You know, this show is over. You should be able to see the playlist a few hours after it at TechGuyLabs.com. Just one of the many fabulous features at TechGuyLabs.com. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, moving on to Cy, Lakewood, California. Hi, Cy. Yo. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm great. Welcome. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I listen to you on KFI. That is a very nice station. Oh, yeah. That Boy, Bill that's... Handel guy, what a gem. He's, yeah, he's, he's nuts, you know, but, but some of the people there left the secret out that he's actually he's a, a really you know nice what? guy. He's, he's a sweetie. I know, yeah. it's the funniest thing, because he plays such a grump on the radio, but he's actually oh, the sweetest guy. And he's been very kind to me, and I do uh, every Friday morning about 7.40, I uh, come on, at 7.45, yeah. I come on the show. Yeah, I usually yeah. hear that. I'm yeah. usually he makes me, he's got pictures, one. and I have no choice. Ah, uh. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny a bit ago you were talking about uh, no chimney no problem <laughs> the other night i heard on one of the late night shows it's um kind of a soul funk group called sharon jones and the dap kings and they've got a song called no chimneys in the projects oh <laughs> how does santa get in yeah, oh. well, they tell you in the song, you have to buy the album. Oh, it sounds good. I like it. <laughs> sounds like a classic R&B. Yeah. yeah, they had a great sound. Oh, really good. I love R&B. Yep. Anyhow, I got a problem here that I've got a, an even older phone. I got a Note 2. Oh, my goodness. I'm way behind. I got one, too. <laughs> I have all the notes. I bought. I bought into this big phone thing back when people mocked me I, with a Note 1. They said, what the heck is that? Oh, yeah, they laughed at you me. You own a tennis it. racket up to your ear? What is that? Exactly. But now everybody's used to it. Yeah. I love it. I've had, oh, I, yeah. The Note 5, which is the most recent, is an excellent phone. So the Note yeah. 2, nothing wrong with it? No, no. The Note 2 is nothing wrong with it except with my particular Note 2. It, it decides to restart whenever it's in the mood. It just restarts, you know, and, yeah. and or locks me out, and i got to pull it apart, take the battery out to get yeah. it to go. At least you can do that. It sounds like it's or something in there. What, no, you know, it would be worth resetting the phone. You know, the factory reset. Mm -hmm. It would be worth doing that just to see if there's some corrupt software on their operating system or something. And if that doesn't do it, it may, it's probably, by the way, a hardware issue. It's probably just age. Okay. Uh, phones age fast because they're in your pocket. They're getting banged around, and uh, right. you've had right. that one for a few years. Yeah, um, years. just about two years. That's well, not too bad. Yeah, uh, it shouldn't be happening, uh, but it's cr but it's crashing. That's what it's happening, by the way. That yeah, that that reset crashes. is just it's a crash. Yeah, it crashes and it restarts on. Yeah, it restarts. Is it the wrong? So here's what I a couple of things you can do. Uh, first thing was just do the factory reset. It's in the settings. You'll have to restore the whole thing. You can back it up first. Uh, in the settings, also there's backup and reset in the same menu entry. Make sure you back up ahead of time. That at least will save what apps you have and so forth. Well, this now you say back up. On the phone? No, it backs it up to Google's servers. Oh, okay. All right. And Samsung also do that if you have a Samsung account. 
Uh, that way you don't have to re-enter it a whole lot. You still have to re-download the apps, things like that. Right, right. That well, how about backing it up to my PC? Um, you can't. There are there are apps. There's an there's a, an app called Helium, for instance, that will back up your phone. I don't recommend that, to be honest. You're backing up whatever damaged files there are. Um, well, yeah, that's kind of what. Yeah. I'm do the about, do the do factory reset. Up. That'll take it back to the factory state. See if it works. If it does, you can restore your data and restore your apps, and and you'll be good as new. It's you know even you would do that with a Windows machine after a few years. Oh right? yeah, yeah. Well, I do want to back up. Like my photos, all all that on my PC. I just want them. Yeah, you can do it. Just hook and, up the. Then, yeah. It, it, with a Samsung, it, that phone looks like a, a drive. You put it in yeah. USB mode, and and it mm -hmm. looks like it's a drive, and you could just copy the files off. And that's a good yeah. idea. You should do that anyway. People lose their phones all the time, and they call me and they say, "Oh, I don't know. It was the only copy of the pictures." Yeah. What am I gonna do? I don't know. No, no, you gotta back that on. Yeah. If failing that, before you give up on the hardware. You could um, root the phone. It's old enough now that you can root it and put a more recent operating system on it. Uh, that and that's actually would refresh the phone in ways that might even make it, you know, faster and better in many ways. So that is always an option with Android. The the instructions for that will be on a website called xda-developers.com. The XDA Developers is a hangout. For Android users, you'll search for the exact model, not just Note 2, but go into the settings and it'll be the N9201-B right. or whatever it is. Uh -huh. Get that number, search for that handset. They'll give you step-by-step -step instructions for rooting it, which means giving you super user access, right. putting a new recovery on it. And then with that new recovery, you can put, you can continue to use it as is, but you can put other people's Updated operating systems. My recommendation would be something called Cyanogen Mod. Say that again. Cyanogen. Just C M C Y A N Cyan, the color O G E N, Cyanogen. Hmm. And the yeah. Cyanogen mods are probably the best Android modifications out there. And you could put CM12 on there, which would put Marshmallow on there. Be, be the latest version of the operating system. It might be a good update. Oh, cool. yeah. Only do that if, A, you're, you're comfortable hacking around with your system a little bit. It's not dangerous, <laughs> but it's fun. Well, yeah, it would be. I but would, follow those instructions carefully. Learn more of that stuff yeah, you learn I'm, more. Yeah. I'm old, and I didn't grow up with computers, so. <laughs> me too. I know how you feel. But, but boy, those oh, yeah, abacuses. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, believe me, I'm uh, 59. I'm old enough to remember a day before yeah, computers. I'm, I'm older than that. But <laughs> I, I, uh, I just didn't grow up. With I had computers. a slide rule in high school. How about that? Does that count? Yeah. I still have my slide rule. <laughs> I love slide rules. <laughs> my father-in-law gave me a 12-foot slide rule that he used in his classroom. He was a high school oh, yeah. science we, teacher. Yeah, we had one hanging in the, those? over the blackboard. Yeah. Blackboard? What's kind blackboard? Of, yeah, right. <laughs> blackboard? <laughs> what are you talking about? They're white. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah anyway, this big, this big is a classic rule. phone that there are lots of mods for, and it's a good it's a good phone you could play with a little bit. So Yeah, yeah. Well, if, I, I if, love the phone. I hardly ever go to sit at the real computer. It's a great screen, the stylus, everything. Yeah, it's, I'm yeah. holding mine right now. You made me uh, a little nostalgic. <laughs> hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Okay, we'll thank put you. all the uh, links in the show notes to the Cyanogen mod and, uh, and uh, XDA developers and all of that. Curtis in Virginia, I think you're going to be the last call of the day. Hi, Curtis. Got a couple of minutes for you. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting a um, air. I watch your uh, program on a Roku. Okay. The live stream. Yeah. And uh, on the in the morning, I'll I'll turn you on and just watch what was going on the next day. Thank you. But but uh, here the um, past couple of times I've been turning it on, I get like a purple screen that says. HDCP, uh -oh. unauthorized access. Oh, that's nuts. And I know... We're not copy know protected. Twit, I know the Twit Network would let me watch anything. <laughs> We're not copy protected. <laughs> so that's what HDCP is. It's the high-def copy protection scheme that the Blu-ray folks and the Hollywood and so forth uh, put on high-def stuff. In That requires that every device, the playback device, even the cable... Even the screen, they all need to be HDCP compliant. But, of course, our content is not HDCP encoded. We don't use copy protection. Right. So I'm not sure why you're getting that. It's it's a, a, a spurious error message. It's, it's, it's incorrect. Uh, what are you watching? Are you watching it from Twit? I'm watching it on a Roku stick from the... Oh, Roku um, stick. Okay. Roku stick. I, you know, and have you powered down the TV and unplugged the stick and then all of that stuff? I, 
I do. Whenever I turn it off and turn it back on, then I can, you know, sometimes I can watch it again. Uh, you know, yeah. I, watch you. I mean, I can watch you then. Uh, so it doesn't happen all the time, and I know it's hard to fix a problem that doesn't happen all the yeah. time. I'm just wondering if it's in my if the Roku stick's getting old, or if I no, need no, it's something's confused or something. Something's confused, I, and you know I haven't heard of that problem, so I'm not sure what the yeah. answer is. I'm sorry to say, and it, we're out of time, so I can't continue on. But I'll tell you what, chat room, anybody listening, we've got a couple of open questions. TechGuyLabs.com, your input, please. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. -T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today and Tech News Tonight. And of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.